Welcome to another one of my videos. You can help support this channel by subscribing and liking and by grabbing one of my free ebooks. I'll leave a link in the upper right hand corner of the screen and there will be also a link in the description for my free ebooks. Now to the video. In today's video, we're going to be listening to um, How to Frame a Murder, Part 1, Cat Painting Mystery. It is the first book of two for How to Frame a Murder. You can grab the illustrated ebook off of Amazon. It is an Amazon exclusive. I will leave a link for the ebook on Amazon in the upper right hand corner. It'll take you to my website and I will also leave a link in the description for the ebook. That way if you would like to, you can grab it and follow along and see all the illustrations. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the read. How to Frame a Murder, Part 1, Cat Painting Mystery, Part of the Ronan Have Sword Will Travel Mystery Series, by Christy Lynn Higgins, Copyright 2020, Prologue. The world of Magi fused East and West cultures during an era before the emergence of the steam engine. In this world, the sword was the ultimate weapon and brought order to the planet under the emperor of the Kenjin Empire. The Shogun was the highest ranking military officer who was just under the emperor in power. The Shogun along with the Shogunate, military officers with the title of overlords, reigned supreme over the citizens of the One World Empire. Each overlord ruled a clan, and each clan was made up of samurai houses. Each samurai or lord in their house owed their allegiance to only one overlord who was their master. The samurai were the military nobility and officer caste, and they ruled over a province for their overlord in this social class system. Below each samurai were many wealthy families who governed their own estates and were scattered about the towns of the samurai's province. One family could have many estates and each family was under their family head. The families supported their samurai house with honor gifts of crops, animals, material and or coin depending on their size and their own wealth and the samurai houses in turn gave tribute to their overlord out of the same materials taxes were collected by governors of each town and the taxes went to road and irrigation maintenance and or other projects the kenjin empire was broken down into regions which under the authority of the emperor and shogun were ruled by the overlords regions were made up of provinces under the rule of the samurai lords Provinces were further broken down into towns governed by governors. A governor was placed in charge of each town but no family, house, or clan owed their allegiance to them. The governors owed their allegiance to the samurai of their province and the overlord the samurai served. Magi was enjoying a time of peace and prosperity. Rivalries between overlords were fought with words and speeches on the floor of the shogunate house and not on the battlefield. Bandits were still a problem but usually only in the remote areas. Peace seemed a thing of everlasting existence, and war was perceived as a mythical beast that only lived in the legends of the past. The soul of tea. I was alone. I was wandering. Now I have a companion. Now I have a direction. And now I can really taste the tea. Chapter 1. Horosha, the great Ronin detective. The Ronin, Horosha, the precocious little girl who had grown into an intuitive young woman of 17, and her companion, Rico, a streetwise boy of 10, traveled by foot along a dirt road through the town of Yukon. They were heading toward the town next to Yukon. The town of Yukon was part of the Kai province, and the town was where her sister was the governor's wife. They walked the outskirts of Yukon, leaving to start their new journey, a voyage of discovery and danger that would shape future journeys. She and the boy had left her sister's estate in the wee hours of the morning even before the sun had cracked over the horizon like the yellow of an egg. The sun had peaked over the edge of the nearby mountain by the time she arrived at the town postings to see if she had any work. She had found work on the postings and had started for the client's estate. Horosha and Rico both held a small baked fish on a stick and were happily eating them for breakfast as they traveled. She wanted to have tea with their small meal but decided for the sake of not having to stop during their travel and relieve herself. She would wait and have tea later during their mid-travel break. They neared the last few buildings of the town of Yukon, and a few peddlers of different wares shouted after them. A woman, holding vegetables as her little boy held onto her kimono, yelled, five white radishes for three zinc. Hot dumplings here. A man selling food shouted from his stall. Hot dumplings, four zinc. Spend your coin here. Hot dumplings. A man, standing at the end of an alley with a woman just behind him, 
yelled, Ronan, eight copper for her time. Fans. A different man shouted. Silk fans, eight zinc apiece. The Ronan waved them all away as she and the boy kept walking, eating their baked fish. A vendor selling knives and swords did catch her attention, and she went over and bought a unique knife that had a snail design on its sheath. Why did you buy that little dagger? The boy questioned as they walked on. You have the tanto that I gifted you. I also wanted a small blade that I could cut vegetables and meat while we travel. He removed the gifted tanto from his sash, and the longer knife had a koi design on its bamboo sheath. Rico insisted as if he had been insulted. I don't use your brother's tanto to cut vegetables. I would only use the knife to protect you or myself. As you should, Horosha told him as she grabbed hold of the tiger claw necklace around her neck which also once belonged to her older brother. They left the town, looking forward to their new destination. It was to be their first official case working together, and Horosha had become restless or at least her mind had. Her body enjoyed the hot spring and endless tea and rest her sister. Sakura showered her with at her estate. Sakura had her baby sister back in her life, and she doted on her. Horosha grinned as she thought of the love her sister had for her. As much as she adored the attention, her mind needed stimulation and since there were no mysteries to solve, Horosha had to go back to work. She glanced at the boy beside her. Horosha had taken Rico under her wing for he reminded her so much of her older brother, who had died in a tragic fire. The Ronin had received the name Horosha from the boy when they first met, and the name meant wanderer. She made a living by leaving an advertisement at different town postings, offering her services. A town postings was an erected sign, usually at the entrance to a town, made of wood for people and, or the empire to issue announcements and job listings. Her ad was very simple. Have sword, will travel nearly said it all and word of mouth had also spread her fame. Though, she was still fairly unknown as a detective and problem solver. Tea haiku, a yellow sunrise, a southeast refreshing breeze, early summer tea. Chapter two, forward toward a new case. The air was cool when they started out and grew gradually warmer. They traveled for an hour, seeing the different sights of the countryside. The journey would take another two hours to complete, including the time she had set aside for a break. They would arrive at their destination at about 11 a.m. Horosha was still getting used to the new name that the boy had given her. She had gone by Ronan for some time but liked the name Horosha. She also liked the nickname the boy gave her, Horo, which meant Abacus and was his way of saying that she was very clever. She was glad for the companionship the boy offered. Horosha had been alone for so long, and Rico was eager to learn from her. The day grew especially hot and the wind very scarce as they traveled on foot. She was in a very good mood and hummed a tune to herself. Horosha greeted everyone they met and took in the sights all around them as Rico stayed on guard and was wary of everyone they came across. She wore her favorite hat, a Ronangasa, a conical hat made from bamboo with a tuft of bamboo sticking straight up like a tassel. It was large and kept the sun off of her face and shoulders. She loved the bamboo hat that her teacher, Sensei Hanju, the crying samurai, had given her. Though, if one heard it told from the crying samurai's point of view, she had stolen his favorite hat and refused to give it back to him. The crying samurai had taught her nearly everything she knew about the sword and the coat of the samurai. Her katana had a red crown crane decorating its white scabbard, and the sword was tucked in her sash. The sword belonged to her father, and it was the same sword her brother used to defend her and her sister when ninjas infiltrated their home long ago. The hat and the sword were among her treasured items and each held fond memories. Horosha wore a simple dark blue kimono and black hakama, traditional Japanese trousers. She also wore zori, sandals made from straw. The boy wore yukata, a light cotton kimono, and he was barefooted. Horosha enjoyed her life of wandering as the ronin detective, but she had also found it a bit lonely. Riko was just the person she needed. A companion who enjoyed her company, didn't mind traveling, and also had a mind for mystery. Life lessons from tea, martial arts and brewing tea, both art forms unto themselves. Chapter 3, Martial Arts and Tea, Along the Dirt Road. Their journey continued and 10 minutes later, they stopped at a roadside eatery for their mid-travel break. They would grab some tea and rice balls and some well-needed shade. The eatery's table section was uncovered. Horosha removed her sword from her sash and placed it on a wooden table. She untied her roningasa and set the hat on a bench, and then she sat beside it at the table. Her violet black hair was pulled back in a ponytail. She fanned herself with her hand. Rico noticed her doing so and left and came back some time later. Several people had walked by the eatery on their own journeys by the time he returned. Here, Rico said. She looked at the folding fan the boy offered her, and then Horosha asked, Where did you get it? I bought the sensu from a man who is selling them from his shop that is next to the eatery. The workmanship is exquisite and the watercolor. 
Horosha spoke after taking the paper folding fan and paused as she smiled at the red crown cranes that decorated it. The bird was her family's crest. She smoothed her hand over the image and then finished with, dot 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 is very beautiful. You should not have spent your money on me. You are supposed to spend your coins on yourself. In a way, I did spend the coins on myself, Rico stated and then explained. If your mind becomes overheated, you will begin to whine and not focus on the case we are about to take. If you cannot focus on the case, you will not get paid. If you do not get paid, I will make no more money. I understand. I will accept your gift as it will be helping you in the future. She gladly fanned herself with the sensu as she said, I have been thinking. We should come up with some rules that we follow when taking cases. I hear that the great samurai detective has his own set of rules. Are you comparing yourself to that old man again? The boy questioned. I am not comparing. I am only emulating sound practice as one should do when creating a new martial art. She turned around on the bench so better to face the boy and leaned back and rested her back on the table as she continued to fan herself. One should incorporate the best qualities and practices from already great martial artists. Are you saying that detective work is like martial arts? I am, Horosha answered. Both take skill and practice and dedication. You would be wise to learn this. Martial arts is like brewing tea. The more you practice at it, the better the tea tastes. The soul of tea. I made a connection. A tea leaf of flavor. I will walk this new path and see where it takes me. Chapter 4. A change in status for a certain boy. The eatery, a cool breeze that had escaped the heat of the day swept through the kiramatsu, the black pines, that shaded the eatery, and the breeze brought the pleasant smells of early summer and refreshing evergreen. Horosha closed her eyes as she took in the sounds and scents. A bubbling brook was a short distance behind the eatery, and an insect was buzzing about somewhere in the eatery. She opened her eyes and spotted the usukashiba, the hummingbird hawk moth, a day flying moth fluttering by a pink flower. The insect seemed a bit picky for it moved to a different flowering plant. I was lucky that you took me as your apprentice, Rico spoke, pulling her from her thoughts. I will never forget what you have done for me in one day. I hope to repay your generosity. Do good and help others and you will have repaid me, she told him. I see that you enjoy helping others as I do. I don't know about that, Rico said. I like helping myself. I help you and you help others and in turn, you end up helping me. She told him, you might be cautious and wary of others, but I still believe you find satisfaction in helping. Rico muttered, I like helping you, Horo. She heard his comment but said nothing about it. Instead, Horo Shaw lifted her bamboo hat that had been hiding something. I was busy while you were gone. I also bought you a non-gift, she told him. I believe they are your size. A pair of Zori sat on the bench. Rico got all teary-eyed as he stared at them. Shoes. Horo Shaw was giving him a pair of shoes. He would no longer be the barefoot boy but had gained a little status as he would be wearing shoes. He turned around and faced away from her as he wiped his eyes. Horo Shaw didn't expect this reaction out of him and she wasn't sure how to react. Rico, I just, it is nothing, he said as he turned back around. I got a little dust in my eyes. Let me try them on. The boy grabbed the sandals made from straw and went to the other side of the table and sat on the bench. He cleaned off his dirty feet as best as he could, and then he put on the sandals. They fit, they fit perfectly. Good, Horosha said as she turned around on the bench and faced him. Now we can eat once the owner comes out with our order rice balls and green tea, food, drink, pleasant company, time spent quite wisely, of vices and addictions. Some time later, the owner of the eatery came out with their order, and the two of them began to eat. Horosha sipped on the green tea before she started on her meal while Rico immediately started to devour his. What sort of rules should we have? Rico inquired as he started on his second rice ball of three. Horosha glanced at her plate of the same amount of rice balls and said, let us start with three rules and then build on them as needed. He asked, do you have any rules in mind? Yes, the first one should include these two things. Once I take a case, I stick with it until it is solved whether or not the client wants me to continue with it. The client should also agree to my rules before I take on their case. Why did you pick those two things to be your first rule? Rico inquired. I'm like a tiger with a bone in that sense, she replied. Once I hear a mystery, I have to solve it no matter where it takes me. Rico questioned, what should our second rule be? I don't know, do you have a suggestion? Since I am in charge of the financial part of the business, I think rule number two should incorporate the needs that you have for taking the case along with what you will charge by the day. Oh, like we talked about when we were leaving my sister's estate and heading here. He nodded, okay, that will be the second rule but also remember that I charge by the day what the client can afford. Your sliding scale of daily wages is why you are so poor. The boy told her, you take on too many non-paying cases. I can't help myself, she told him. 
I can't pass up a mystery no matter how small. The boy suggested, maybe you should think of your stomach more often, and I am talking about how you are going to fill it if you have no coin. I promise to be more considerate of our needs now that you are with me and I am responsible for two stomachs. Rico was so much like her older brother who had the same name. The boy might only be 10 but, by what she could surmise, Rico had been raising himself for at least the last two years. She did need to be more responsible. More Horo, one who uses her brain, and less like Horo Shah, one who wanders without a care in the world. She took another sip of her tea. What about the third rule? She asked. I don't know, Rico replied. Maybe we can make that one up as we go through this case. You know, as the need arises, I like that plan, Horo Shah said. Make it so. Tea that is planned is nice but so is tea that is a surprise. He stared at her for a few moments, and then Rico said, Sometimes I wish I knew what you were talking about. She chuckled and suggested, Just think about what I do say and the more you get to know me, the more what I say will make sense. And speaking of tea, go see if this place has a specialty or a rare blend for me to try. I believe you are an addict, the boy told her. Why do you say that? Rico told her, Tea always seems to be on your mind. Life lessons from tea. Worry and trouble should be strained from life as tea leaves are strained from tea. Chapter 6. The Gaka Estate. In the Kenjin Empire, a family was those who were related by blood or adoption. A household was those who lived together under one roof like an estate, so a household included all the servants and the main family. An estate was the entire area of a wealthy family's home which included anything within its wooden or stone walls like the grounds, the gardens, servants' quarters, and the manor. The manor was all the buildings that made up the family's main home and was usually in the center of the estate or at the front. The Gaka estate was the largest one in the town of Kiramatsu where Manzo was the governor. It was within the Gama province and very close to the border of the Kai province. The estate had been built over the decades and centered around a tall seven-story building, the tallest building on the estate, and the tallest building in the town. The Yellow Lotus Studio was where the master painter worked as it had a grand view of the surrounding lands. One could stare out at nature and soak up the life and spirit of things and then put those feelings to paper. The Gaka family belonged to the Lotus Frog Clan who was ruled by the Lotus Frog Samurai House. The Gaka estate was square and had several buildings along with the buildings belonging to the manor. The front entrance which was the south gate had a large wooden gate big enough that a two-horse drawn carriage could easily enter through it. The gate remained shut even during the day to help safeguard the precious items within the estate. The walls around the entire estate were 10 feet high and made out of stones. One other entrance entered the estate from the west side and was only large enough for two people to enter side by side. It was also guarded. The south gate opened into a large courtyard where a stable was positioned off to the east. Another wall closed in the south courtyard and the courtyard gate opened into the peacock garden where three pairs of the large green and blue birds lived alongside a dozen bonsai trees in their own individual planters. A single cherry tree stood in its center. A walkway snaked around the garden and ended at a short covered walkway to the manor. Both the walkway and the garden and the short covered walkway were made of white gray gravel. One of the few doors on the estate was at the front entrance of the manor and was made of redwood and engraved with a frog sitting on a lotus pad and the lotus was in full bloom. Anyone entering the manor by the front did so through the main hall. The manor had all wooden floors except for a few rooms that had dirt floors like the tiny kitchen. The main hall was decorated with hundreds of paintings that the Gaka family, past and present, had created over the course of 60 years. Tatami and the Shoin. A tatami was a type of mat used as a flooring material. Tatami were made twice as long as wide and the standard size was three by six feet. Tatami were covered with woven soft rush straw, or was made from rice straw. The long sides were edged with plain cloth and only purchased by the wealthy upper class and regular tatami had no edging. The term tatami was derived from the word tatamu, meaning to fold or pile. Tatami was a luxury item for the nobility. The lower classes had mat covered earthen floors. The ruling nobility and samurai slept on tatami or woven mats called goza while commoners used straw mats or loose straw for bedding. The shoin was a large rectangular drawing room and the largest room within the Gaka Manor that entertained guests. The shoin stretched out like a banquet hall with only one entrance and could easily hold 50 people. The master and mistress of the manor were always positioned at the far end of the shoin as if they both sat at the head of a table. And they looked over their guests and other family members who sat with their backs facing each side's length of the room. The guests and other family members faced one another in the center of the room. On the right side's length, that was to the master and mistress, sat in order the person with the next highest rank in the family under the master and so on. On the left side's length sat guests in order of their rank in society. The shoin was usually only used on special occasions such as banquets. 
The center of the room was left clear for entertainers of dance and other types, and servants walked the back walls as they brought in food and drink. A floor tray was common in the shoin. It was a small single serving tray-like table with short legs that one sat at and ate from. The person would sit on a tatami or if the family was wealthy, they would sit on a floor pillow on the tatami and enjoy their meal. Time. Time was kept by most by the position of the sun and then later the moon, depending on the season. Clocks and pocket watches did exist but only for the wealthy. Morning rise equals 6 a.m. Midday tea equals 12 p.m. Evening hour equals 6 p.m. Money. There was no paper money. All currency was in metal coins. A zinc coin had the smallest coin value. 10 zinc coins equaled a copper coin. 10 copper coins equaled a nickel coin. 20 nickel coins equaled a silver coin. 20 silver coins equaled a gold piece or gold coin. Zinc coin equals penny. Copper coin equals dime. Nickel coin equals dollar. Silver coin equals $20. Gold coin equals $400. The standard size coins listed above were the size and thickness of a quarter with a square or round hole through their center so that they could be carried on a string or metal loop. Most people dealt with zinc, copper, and nickel coins. Only the wealthy and merchants dealt with silver and gold. Other coins were created that were larger and thicker and had a higher value. 3 zinc equals 3 pennies. 8 copper equals 80 cents. 8 nickel equals 8 dollars. 5 silver equals $100. 5 gold equals $1,000. The soul of tea. I obsess over mysteries. I obsess over tea. I obsess over hot springs. And I really enjoy all three. Chapter 7. Forward to the client's estate. The eatery. Horo Shah enjoyed herself, sitting in the shade. The boy had left on a short errand for her, one she hoped he would find much success at. Her tea was warm but that didn't bother her. Tea at any temperature was good for the taste buds. She noticed a path nearby that wound through some trees and beyond it was a field full of sunflowers. Horo Shah thought about walking back there and smelling them. She had never smelled the flower before, but she decided to let her lazy body indulge itself some more. I am sorry, but they don't have a specialty tea or a rare blend here, Rico said after he returned from talking to the owner of the eatery. Horo Shah sighed as she spoke. I would only be spoiled if every place we stopped at did have such a potentially tasty treat. Let us rest here and enjoy our food and tea that we do have for a little longer, and then we should be on our way. The boy nodded. Horo Shah continued to sip on her green tea that was half gone as she looked around at their beautiful surroundings. Some might say that the black pines were somewhat twisted and misshapen but she found beauty in their unique forms and growths. She thought this would be an excellent place to sit forever and lounge about. But her mind would start to grumble over indulging her lazy body too long. I love the sounds of summer, Horo Shah spoke as she closed her eyes and envisioned a past. I used to play with my brother on the shores of a stream that ran by our home. We would hunt frogs and bugs. I loved him so much. He is the one who also bears my name, the boy stated, knowing how she sometimes looked at him as if she saw a beloved ghost. Rico asked, are you sure you can just give up your revenge? My older sister, Sakura, is alive, so my family was not completely wiped out. I also have you, the priestess, and the crying samurai. I do not need to risk my life to find who murdered my father and my brother. I can focus on helping people. I have to let go of my hatred. Have you? He asked. Have you let go of your hatred? She stared at the dark green liquid in her cup and changed the subject by saying, Today, I can tell. Today is going to be a very good day. Today, we have our first official case together. Horo Shah and Rico, the master detective and her apprentice. The boy understood that she didn't want to talk about it, so he asked, now you are a master detective. I am, she said. I see all, hear all. Nothing slips by my apt mind. She declared, I am Horo Shah the Ron and detective. Evil doers beware. Horo Shah chuckled to herself, amused by her own declaration. She had a long way to go before she would be a master detective. Experience was all that she was lacking, and she had been gaining that the year she had been traveling as the Ronin. Rico, I have never asked, but can you tell me about your family? I only know that you were living on the streets and hustling. I was not hustling, the boy corrected her. I was only offering my services to anyone who could use them. You mean you offered your services to anyone you thought had coins and would not mind parting with a few? I have connections and I can get things done, Rico said. At least that was true in the town we left. I do not know many people in Kiramatsu. But you do know a few, Horo Shah spoke. You are a very resourceful and clever boy. I imagine you still will be very useful in my cases. What do you know about our current case? Rico inquired. I only know that something was stolen. Most of my cases involve missing or stolen items. Horo Shah and Rico finished their rice balls and green tea and continued on their journey. Tea haiku. Dusty roads. Small towns. Tea with a hint of lemon. Makes dry throats refreshed. The town postings chief. 
The town postings chief was a person whose job it was to collect messages left by those replying to a town postings. It was customary to tip the town postings chief when he relayed or received a message. It was also the job of the town postings chief to post announcements from the empire and to put up wanted posters. Chapter 8. Placing her ad. The Ronin allowed herself to daydream while they traveled the last tract of their journey. The boy knew the way so she could allow or more like force her overactive mind to take a break and rest before she would fire it up like the forge of a swordsmith. Horosha soaked in more of the sights and sounds of summer as a cicada chirped from a nearby tree. She had learned that the male cicada made the loud shrill droning noise by vibrating two membranes on his abdomen. Some people thought the sound was an overpowering hum, but she loved the worthy insect made in coming across the shells they molted. Horosha also loved studying all types of sciences. The road took them through a valley that was covered in rice paddies. Travelers like themselves were moving one way or another, most by foot but a few by horse or by norimono also known as a litter. Rico's attention was mostly to his feet since they had left the eatery. He was very proud of his new sandals and couldn't help but look at them. He was still wary of those they passed. They entered the town of Kiramatsu, and she immediately went to the town postings. Horo Shaw placed her ad. Have sword, will travel along with a message that she could be contacted at the Gaka estate or they could leave their information with the town postings chief. She and Rico then headed for their destination. Life lessons from tea. Tea is like painting. Each tipped cup and sip, like the stroke of a brush, bring happiness to the wielder. Chapter 9. Arriving at their destination. The town of Kiramatsu. Horo Shaw was impressed with the town as it had several shops she might peruse later, looking for special and rare blends of tea. First she would have to make some money. They traveled to the outskirts of the town and once they were in sight of the estate, the boy ran ahead of her and then knocked on the main gate. Before they arrived, she saw a tall building that the estate seemed to be centered around. Horo Shaw thought the building would have a great view of the surrounding areas. A Gaka estate guard opened the gate. He was dressed in a black uniform trimmed in yellow, including his boots. He was armed with a spear and a long dagger was sheathed to his belt. Rico told him, Horosha, the great Ronin detective is here. By then, Horosha had joined the boy. She folded her fan and tucked it into her sash beside her new knife. Come in, the master and the mistress are expecting you. The guard led them through the courtyard, next through the peacock garden, across the short walkway, and finally into the main hall where the housekeeper waited on them at the entrance. As was customary in entering a building with a non-dirt floor, a jenkin was there. A jenkin was an entranceway where one removed their shoes. The shoes were left there until needed to return outside. The jenkin was lower than the floor of the main hall and allowed one to sit on a raised ledge while removing and putting on shoes. The guard left as Rico and Horo Shah removed their sandals. The housekeeper led the two of them to where the family had gathered. Along the way, Horo Shah noticed many watercolor paintings decorating the manor. Each one was of a different type of animal. These are very nice, Horo Shah said. All the paintings you see within the manor were created by the Gaka family, the housekeeper pointed out. The master is also a renowned painter of Animaru style of watercolor. I am not familiar with this style, Horo Shah spoke and asked, what sort of style is it? It is a genre and a style of watercolor that breathes life into animals. If you notice, all of the creatures in the paintings seem to be alive, as if they will jump right off the onion skin paper at any moment, Horo Shah commented. You know a lot about the Animaru style. I have been housekeeper here since the master's father was master of the manor, and the Animaru style of watercolor was created by the Gaka family. Very impressive, Horo Shah stated. Almost as impressive as Emerald Dragon Empress T. Emerald Dragon Empress T. The housekeeper repeated. Horo Shah's face lit up as she spoke. Yes, I have only had it once, and it was exquisite like flying above the snow-capped Mount Fuji on a dragon's back. Not that I have ridden on a dragon or that they exist, but it is the only way that I can describe the green tea. She sighed as she added, I have had a few opportunities to drink the tea again, but circumstances have prevented me from doing so. It eludes me, and it irks me to have it so close and it is snatched away. She looked up from her daydreaming of dragons and tea as all three of them had paused in the main hall. And Horo Shah noticed that both Rico and the housekeeper were looking at her as if the imaginary dragon was sitting on her head. She questioned the boy, did I go too far again about my tea obsession? He nodded, I will try not to in the future. I also know that there is no time for tea dreams right now, Horo Shah said. And then she asked as they started walking again. I see that there are many paintings hanging in the main hall. Are there others? I do not know the exact count. I do not know if anyone knows how many paintings there are. The painting room houses many of them. Which ones are your master's paintings? Horo Shah questioned as she motioned to the ones they were passing. I also hear that he has two sons. Where are their paintings? 
I never thought I would come across a family of painters. Does the master's wife also paint? The housekeeper paused and turned to the Ranan as she said, women are forbidden to paint in the style. I did not know that. Is it because women are better at it and the men to not want to be? Rico elbowed her and told her, you can't say things like that. Horoshaw peered at the boy and questioned. I can't. I thought I just did. What I mean is that what you were about to say would have been rude. Oh, I do sometimes speak before I think, she stated. Thank you, Rico. The housekeeper wasn't sure what to say, so she spoke, trying to answer the Ranan. None of these paintings are Master Eshi's. All the paintings you see are either his grandfather's or some other ancestor. I do not think any of his paintings are on display. Why doesn't he display any of his paintings? I do not know why the master does not display any of his work. They are all quite good in my opinion. I have seen them when I have gone into his studio. The housekeeper replied. I believe the steward and myself are the only ones who have seen them. His studio. Would it be the seven-story building we saw behind the manor? It is, the housekeeper replied. The Yellow Lotus Studio is the center building of the estate and the tallest. All of the master's paintings are within. She then added, now as to his sons, neither of them paints. In this whole household, your master is the only one who paints. I am very surprised to hear that. It sounds like this Anamaru style of watercolor is a style that is passed on. Who does he pass it on to if not his sons? I believe the steward told me that Eshi's father had no talent and it was expected. It is said that the Gaka family is cursed as the talent skips every other generation. Because of this curse, Master Eshi never had the heart to teach his sons. Master Eshi urges his sons to marry so that Eshi can teach the next generation. I do not see the sons marrying anytime soon. Lead on, Horosha said. We shouldn't keep your master waiting. The soul of tea. I once thought I could be an artist until I tried my hand at painting. I now watch others paint while I drink tea. Chapter 10. The Gaka Family. Gaka Eshi was the master of the manor. He held no title like the governor, nor did he earn his wealth as a merchant. His family's paintings were sought after the empire over. His estate was vast and included the manor, several gardens, the servants' quarters, the stable, three hot springs, the barracks, and several other buildings and residences. Gaka Eshi was also the Gaka family head in its entirety which included an uncle, two aunts, and several cousins that lived on other estates. Gaka Niko was his wife and the mistress of the manor. She was a very beautiful woman and his second wife. His first wife died nearly 20 years ago after giving him two sons. Niko had given him no children. Gaka Sora was the eldest son, 28, and unmarried. He was the young master of the manor and the heir. Gaka Itsuki was the youngest son, 24, and also unmarried. He was also the young master of the manor but would only inherit half of what his older brother would inherit, and he would not attain the title the master of the manor unless something happened to his older brother. As she called the family together and requested that they all meet in the shoin. He had received word that the Ranan would arrive sometime between 10.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. He and Nico waited in the shoin and each was sitting on their own floor pillow. A floor tray was set up in front of each of them but there was nothing on them. As she and Nico were waiting on his sons to arrive, she inquired of her husband, why are we meeting in the shoin? Would not one of the smaller tatami rooms be more suited to meeting the Ranan? As she told her. The tatami rooms are not available right now. You mean they were wrecked by your older son and his lady friends and have yet to be cleaned? Nico corrected him. You should not let him run so wild. He is destined to take over his master and yet he has not learned any responsibility. You should. He interrupted. You should mind what is yours, and I will mind what is mine. Sora is not your son. You have never been a mother to him. If you would have let me be a mother to the two boys, maybe they would be better men now. Nico snapped. I tried to love them as my own but you would not allow it. They were too old to be mothered. They had to learn to be men, as she told her. Nico frowned as she said, and fine men the two of them have become. The house physician. Samba came in, and then she went and stood beside Nico. I hear we will be having a guest arrive shortly, the house physician spoke, sensing the two had been arguing again. I have requested that the Ron and detective come, as she told her in his usual calm voice, and then he asked her, why are you here? I did not summon you. Nor I, Nico added as she glanced at the woman. Can I not go where I please? The house physician questioned. Can I not check on my lady? Nico peered at her as if she was perturbed with Samba but did not want to scold her and bring her vengeful wrath upon her in case she needed her medicines. Nico said, return to your residence. This matter does not concern you. It is over the painting that was stolen. I will go, the house physician said. I will go, but I will not be ignored. She left just as their youngest son, Itsuki, arrived. 
He bowed before them, sat at his floor pillow that was the second one in line on the right side, and then asked, are you sure we need to bring in an outsider to find the painting? If you will allow me, I will look into the matter. As she peered at his youngest son and questioned, why do I need to give you permission to look into this? It has been a week since the painting went missing. Maybe your youngest is afraid of stepping on his older brother's toes. Nico suggested. Sora can be quite the bully. Itsuki stated with no warmth for the woman who took his mother's position in the household. Nico, I doubt my brother has any interest in finding anything besides a warm bottle of sake and an even warmer bed to crawl into. Sora, the eldest son, entered and asked his father, why have you called this meeting? I have plans for tonight and still have preparations to make. As she glanced over his oldest son's shuffled attire and said, it looks as though you have already entertained your evening plans. Some of them, but the night, or the day is still young, Sora replied. He peered at his father and his father's wife, and then he asked, are we all gathered here to talk about giving me more responsibilities in running the estate? Itsuki scoffed, if you are to receive more responsibilities, should you not be responsible for more than counting the gold in the treasury? Father has let me know we're near the treasury. Sora insisted and then asked, how can I count the gold? Or pocket a few pieces? Itsuki muttered. Sora walked over to his sitting brother and kicked him, toppling him over. Enough? As she yelled as he slammed his fist on his floor tray. It was very rare for him to raise his voice in anger but with the missing painting plaguing his thoughts, he yelled, you will act civil. Sora pointed a finger at his quivering brother, warning him of future reprisals. Itsuki slowly sat up as his older brother went and sat on his floor pillow closest to their father. If we are not to talk about my new responsibilities, why have you gathered us here? Sora questioned. As she answered, I have hired someone to look into the missing painting. The Ronin detective will be here at any time. I want you to give him your full cooperation. The painting, Sora spoke. You mean the one with that cat on it? Your oldest son is so astute. My husband, Nico stated and then her frustrations got the better of her. And she spoke uncharacteristically snide. You should reward him and allow him to do what he wants when he wants. No, wait. He already engages in such actions. You should not pick on me or make me angry. Sora threatened. I am to be the future master. I could make you homeless and penniless. I am the mistress of the manor. Would you dare bring dishonor to this family by doing such a thing to me? Enough. Nico, as she said in a firm voice that wasn't raised. I believe Sora has been picked on enough for today. Picked on enough? Nico questioned as if her husband had no clue what went on in his household. And then she stated, he is a bully. Do you not see how he treats his brother and the servants? I see, as she answered. I see many things, my loving wife. Tihaiku, my apt mind needs work. Mystery. Oh, mystery. Spice tea seat my thoughts. Chapter 11, the Ronin is presented. The main hall. The housekeeper continued to escort them to the shoin. The family turned as the housekeeper entered with a boy and one who appeared to be a very young man. The Ronin was not at all anything like the family expected. The Ronin was much younger and presented himself not as refined as one like the samurai detective. Horo Shah had removed her bamboo hat upon entering the main hall and held it in front of herself. She looked all around, taking everything she could into memory from the structures they walked through, the people who worked for the household, and the animal paintings they passed. The housekeeper introduced their guests to the master and mistress. This is Horo Shah, the Ronin detective and his companion, Rico. Most people saw Horo Shah as a young man, and she never bothered to correct them. She found it made it a lot easier when it came to certain things for most people to believe she was a young man for as long as they decided not to look too close. Greetings, Horo Shah, as she said. Do you know why you have been summoned here? I only know that you are in need of my help, Horo Shah replied after she bowed to them, and that something is missing. The housekeeper took the Ronin's hat as the Ronin and the boy would be staying for a while. The housekeeper then left the shoin. I am in great need of your keen deductive reasoning. My wife tells me that you are a well-known detective. Nico stated, yes, Otsudai-san, the governor's housekeeper of the neighboring town, had high praises for you and your apt mind. I am very pleased that my name is known to you but I will admit that I am still quite unknown, Horo Shah spoke. No matter, as she said, if you can find and return my stolen painting to me, I will reward you handsomely. Horo Shah glanced at the boy and nodded, and then Rico stepped forward as she told them. The boy manages that part of our business. Rico lifted his fist to his mouth, cleared his throat to get everyone's attention, and then said, besides the reward you offered, our fee includes a daily rate along with 
Well, Horo Shah has special needs. Rico questioned, do you have a hot spring? We actually have a few, as she replied. I will make sure that your residence is one of the ones connected to the hot spring. Is there anything else? There is, Rico replied. Horo Shah is a connoisseur of tea. I will put the cook in charge of your tea needs, as she said. You can speak to her about it. And as I said before, we also charge a daily fee, Rico spoke. A silver coin per day with a three coin minimum to be paid up front. You will also provide us with a minimum of three days lodgings and board. As she inquired, is there anything else? We have a rule that we adhere to, Rico stated. Once Horo Shah takes the case, the Ron and detective will stick with the case until it is solved whether or not you as the client wants Horo Shah to continue with it. You must agree to this rule before the Ron and detective takes your case. I agree to your terms, as she spoke. Life lessons from T. Work. Staying busy balanced with rest are both essential as the sun rising and setting is to green tea leaves. Chapter 12. The case accepted. The Shoin. Horo Shah was very pleased that the master agreed to all her terms. She was also very proud of how Rico did his part. They worked exceptionally well together. To the mystery then, Horo Shah said, hardly containing her excitement as Rico told them their terms. First, the tea must be selected. As she stated, I am a little confused. Do you want me to tell you about the painting or do you want to have tea now? Rico spoke up, as I said before, Horo Shah is a connoisseur an actual addict of tea, and uses it as a means to express. Well, things. She leaned to the boy and whispered, I don't know if you should have said that. An addict sounds unprofessional. I say them as I see them, Rico replied. I guess I cannot fault you, Horo Shah spoke. As she still wasn't sure what the boy was talking about. So Horo Shah stated, you can tell me about your missing painting. I come from a long line of painters. And the painting in question is one my grandfather painted and personally gave to me when I was a boy. The painting is valuable, so I had it under lock and key in the vault along with other valuables. About a week ago, I entered the vault and discovered the watercolor painting was missing. Was anything else taken? Horo Shah questioned. No. What was the painting of? She inquired. It is called Staring Feline and is of a calico bobtail cat in the Anamaru style of watercolor. My grandfather's grandfather created the style which the Gaka family has perfected over the generations. Tell me about the vault, Horo Shah requested. It was carved right out of the cliff that is to the rear of the estate. The door has a green fish padlock on it, and I have the only key. A guard is positioned just outside the vault at all times. Tell me about this green fish padlock, she requested. I had it special ordered, as she started. They are of a unique design that makes them hard to pick. Horo Shah asked, do you know of anyone who would steal the painting and, or has the skills to pick the lock? No, as she answered. I would first like to eliminate your family and your household, Horo Shah said. I need your permission to interview everyone and to have access to your entire estate. Granted, as she replied. Show me the vault, Horo Shah said. The first step in brewing tea is, of course, the selection of the tea. The soul of tea. I found there are hundreds, no thousands of teas in the world. I must hurry and taste them if I am to try them all. Chapter 13. The Vault. The Vault Building. Horo Shah took careful notice of the structure that was separate from the manor and took some time to reach. It was the northernmost point of the estate and nearly in the center of the north wall. The vault building was one of several buildings connected by a covered wooden walkway. The vault building was rectangular and had a covered wooden walkway that covered both lengths and the front part's width. The front part's width and the east side's length were open-air walkways. A gate that led to the vault garden and the garden's only entrance was positioned at the front part's width. The garden took up most of the space of the building. The vault garden had a tranquil setting of a rock garden. The rock garden was made up of carefully arranged rocks, water features, and pruned miniature cherry trees. The white gravel had been raked to represent ripples in water. A brown stone path curved around the area, and three benches were set up along the path and each bench had a unique view of the garden. The west side's length of the vault building had an enclosed walkway with only one entrance, and the walkway was the only entrance into the vault room where a guard station was in the door to the vault. The vault room was completely carved out of the cliff and was cave-like. Torches and candles lit up the room where one guard was on duty. A table and chair were in the back of the room for the guard to have his meal. The table was carved out of a large rock and looked to have been recently moved. A wooden door protected the vault, and the green fish padlock was securely in place. Tihaiku. Copper coins are nice. Some money has its uses. Tea is much better. Chapter 14. The Impregnable Vault. The Vault Room. As I said, this treasury was carved right into the rock of the cliffside, 
As she explained after leading Horosha and Rico to the cave-like room, there is only the one entrance, one guard is always on duty standing watch in the vault guard station, and only I have the key to the green fish padlock. Who knew that the painting was in the vault? Horosha questioned. As she answered, every member of my household. How many members are there? My family, the housekeeper, the steward, six male servants, the head guard and his 12 guards, the cook, the groom. No, he retired from keeping my horses. A new groom is on his way. Who else? The house physician and two housemaids, as she replied. Anyone outside of your household? Horosha questioned. The governor of our town, Manzo, and Hoshi the broker? Governor Manzo was a friend of my late father and a great admirer of my grandfather's work, and Hoshi the broker is a collector who is greatly interested in acquiring the staring feline from me. I have already turned down three offers from him for the painting. How good were the offers? Horosha inquired. Very tempting, as she admitted. I paused and considered each offer, and the moments I took to consider whether or not to sell it greatly increased with each offer. I would have sold the painting if it did not hold such sentimental value to me. The steward appeared and said, Master, the merchant who purchased the onion skin paper has sent a messenger to inform you he will be arriving earlier. His business in Nagoya concluded early. The merchant will be here within the week. I placed his order within the vault, as she stated. I did not want any of this order mixing in with my personal paper. When he does arrive, tell me and I will unlock the vault. You are then to gather all the paper within the scroll shelf. Keepa will need to assist you since you will be working in the vault. The steward nodded. Was there anything else? As she inquired. Yes, the new kitchen girl is here. Would you like to see her before she begins her work? I have her letter of recommendation here with me. She served in the Nakamura family for two years under their cook. And she, no need, as she interrupted. Sent her to the cook. The steward left. I will now interview your household, Horosha told Ashi. And I will start with this guard who is currently on duty. She walked over to the guard and inquired, What is your name? Tell me what you know about the stolen painting and where you were when it was stolen. I am Gado. I do not know who stole the painting or where it is now. I was on guard duty here outside the vault the night it was stolen. Horosha inquired, Were you alone while guarding it? I was. Guarding throughout the night must be tiresome. Have you ever fallen asleep on duty? I, Gatto started, glanced at the master, and then replied, I have never fallen asleep. I see, Horosha spoke, went over, and examined the door to the vault, examined the padlock, and then said to the master, show me the vault. He removed a key from his kimono and unlocked the padlock. The vault inside was the size of a small cave. She was given a candle, and then Horosha walked around the room and noticed different valuables within. Horosha saw a large vase in which she looked inside. She saw several statues made of jade, ivory, and gold and a honeycomb-like shelf with rolled-up scrolls occupying most of the holes. A few katanas were displayed on stands and there were many paintings within all hanging up. Horosha pointed to an empty spot on the wall next to the scroll shelf and inquired, was this where you had the staring feline on display? It was, as she replied. She walked around one more time, taking in all of the sights, and then she said, allow me to interview the rest of your household alone. I can uncover more truth if you are not present. I understand, as she spoke. Life lessons from tea. Truth is like tea. The hotter you brew it, the more of the flavor of veracity comes out. Chapter 15. Buildings, Structures, and Doors. Building and Structures. The female servant's quarters was located directly behind the manor, and the male servant's quarters was directly behind their building with a commons area between. Unless going about their daily duties, servants were to stay in their servants' quarters or the commons area. The barracks was located near the center of the estate. The guards were also to stay in the barracks unless on duty. Guard stations were set up throughout the estate. The guard stations were simple and included a small structure called a sentry box. The sentry box was large enough for one guard to stand in if he needed to get out of the rain or cold. The guards were armed with a spear and a long dagger. Several residences that housed guests of the family were scattered about the estate. Currently, only the house physician occupied one of the residences. Her residence also served as the dispensary and was full of dried herbs and potted plants. Doors. In the traditional architecture of the Kenjin Empire, Fusuma were vertical rectangular panels that slid from side to side to redefine spaces within a room or act as doors. Fusuma were painted with scenes from nature such as mountains, forests, or animals. Shoji was a sliding outer or inner door made of a lattice screen covered with white paper. The soul of tea. I love the smell and warmth of a kitchen. It can tell you everything you need to know about a home. Home, hearth, and tea. Chapter 16. Interviewing the household. Komi. The cook, 
Komi, your name means having a small smile. Horov Shah stated as she and Rico stood in the tiny kitchen that had a dirt floor. There was a larger kitchen within the manor, but it was only used if a banquet or other type of gathering was planned or a large number of guests were staying overnight on the estate. The old shorter woman glared at her as if she had better things to do than listen to some crazy detective prattle on about names and their meanings. Rico leaned to Horosha and whispered, maybe her name should mean no smiles. Horosha tried not to laugh and covered her mouth with her fist as she coughed to hide her snicker. She focused on her duty and asked, were you in bed all night on the night in question? I was asleep. The cook replied and then spoke to the kitchen girl. You need to wash the rice first before you start to cook it. Did no one teach you anything? Horosha inquired, do you remember seeing or hearing anything that night? The old cook snapped, didn't you hear me? I said I was asleep. How could I see or hear anything? Rico leaned to Horosha again and whispered, maybe her name should mean yells a lot. They walked out of the tiny kitchen into a small courtyard, and Horosha noticed where the wood was stacked for the kitchen. Bamboo was part of the piles, and she noticed several of the bamboo pieces had clear lacquer on them. She picked up one of the bamboo sticks that was twice the thickness of her finger, examined it, and noticed it had been broken and not cut. Horosha went back into the tiny kitchen. Komi, who supplies wood for your kitchen? The steward keeps me stocked, the cook replied. I'll be taking this, Horosha stated as she waved the lacquer bamboo, turned, and headed for their next destination, Kipa, the head guard. Horosha moved on to the barracks and interviewed five of the guards, who had come off of duty, and they said that they had been sleeping the night of the theft. She found Kipa getting in some spear practice within the practice range and questioned him. He wore a black uniform trimmed in red as he was the leader of the estate's guards. I had evening patrol that night as I do every night and was on duty until dawn, the head guard told her. I made my round starting at 11 p.m. I saw the eldest son and the house physician that night. No outsider came into the estate that day, and the south gate and west gate were both secured and were never open that night. Emery, the housekeeper. I got up about 3 a.m. The guard on fire watch had just called out the time. Rico and Horosha followed the housekeeper as she went to check on the two maids who were cleaning one of the tatami rooms. Horosha questioned, why did you get up? I heard someone whispering outside of my room, the housekeeper replied. She motioned with her head to one of the two women tidying up the room as the housekeeper said, it was one of the housemaids, and she was well, speaking to one of the guards. The other housemaid, who had not been accused, giggled, overhearing the conversation. And then Emery continued, I shoot her into her room and told the guard not to come back to our part of the estate or I would report him to the head guard. Have you ever had problems with the guards before? Horosha inquired. Never, Kipa, the head guard always kept his men in line, making sure they were at their guard stations or in the barracks. He does not tolerate any of his men being where they should not be. Horosha asked her, what did you do after you shooed the wayward guard away? I checked to make sure both housemaids were in their room and in their beds, and then I returned to my room. The three of us stay in the female servants' quarters along with the cook. The cook was also in her room. I know this for I heard her snoring. The housekeeper turned to one of the maids and said, go to the tiny kitchen and tell the cook to prepare the mistress berries and then take them to her room. Mistress Nico requested a snack. The steward ordered them from one of the merchants who goes to Nagoya. They should have arrived by now. I heard the merchant return yesterday. The housekeeper turned to the ranin and inquired, was there anything else? House physician, Samba. Horosha and Rico went to one of the residences on the estate. The house physician was there alone as if no one ever visited her. Samba was tending to some plants in the dispensary. The building was called the Red Clover Residence for the pinkish flowers grew wild around the residence and were often found drying within the dispensary. I was tending to the mistress around midnight in her room in the manor. Samba spoke. Nico had a bad headache. She has severe ones about once a week. I was with her until about 1 a.m., and then I returned here. I saw the head guard and the eldest son on my way back. I saw nothing suspicious. Hakairo, the steward. Horosha and Rico went back into the manor and came across the steward in his office, keeping the books. The steward's office was located across from Eshi's office and at the end of the main hall. It was a corner room. Eshi's office was also a corner room. I believe I was up around 12.30 a.m. Our groom had quit and the replacement has yet to arrive, so I had to tend to a horse that was sick. I saw the oldest son sneak in well, one of his lady friends through the south gate. He didn't exactly sneak her in as he normally does. The guard on duty let them in. The steward adjusted his stance before continuing. Sora usually takes his company to one of the residences on the west wall that he is able to sneak into without being seen. It is like he is a ghost. He paused and then added, I was up with the horse until about 7 a.m. And then I went to bed, 
Horo Shaw told him, I found this lacquer bamboo among the wood the cook uses in her fires. Did you place it among the wood piles? The steward took the clear lacquer bamboo and examined it, and then he answered, I did not place it there, but it is not uncommon for wood that is to be thrown away to end up in her wood piles. Though, this piece would smoke with the lacquer on it. It should not have been placed in the woodpile. Thank you for your time, Horo Shaw said as she turned and headed for her next interview. One moment, the steward called after the ranan. A runner arrived some time ago and had a message for you. He removed a paper from his kimono and held it out. She took it and read the message. What is it? Rico inquired. Horo Shaw replied, We already have a second job. There are no details but the message urges us to visit the town postings chief as soon as we are done with our current case and more information will be given to us. She turned to the boy and smiled as she said, This is a good sign, a very good sign. In no time, we will have lots of work. Tea haiku? Tea is on my mind. A shrewd clue will have to do. Until next tea time. Chapter 17. The Center. The Back of the Manor. Horo Shah and Rico went to the tallest building on the estate, the focal point on which the estate was built around. She and the boy walked into the building which was mostly empty. They were waiting on the steward to arrive so that he could announce their arrival to the master of the manor. She decided to explore while they waited. The first level had crates stored there but nothing else. They walked up to the second level and there was paper in different sizes. Horo Shaw walked around and studied the blank papers, and they all appeared to be onion skin paper for the Anamaru style of watercolor. They went up to the third level and there were herbs and material gathered to be grounded down to create watercolor paints. She walked around and looked at all the materials that had been gathered, and she was surprised by a few. They went up to the fourth level and there was a place set aside to rest and to partake of food, a place to take a break from work. They went up to the fifth level and there were many paintbrushes, including those whose bristles were being created from the hair of deer, goat, or horse. They went up to the sixth level and paintings hung all around the room. She went and looked at each and by the signature that was on them. They had all been created by Eshi. She wondered why they were here where few would see them and not in the manor. Horo Shaw went up to the seventh level, the highest level in there. A signal paper with not one stroke upon it laid out on a floor desk. Brushes and paints had been set up beside the rolled out onion skin paper, but it was as if Eshi had sat there day after day waiting for an image to speak to him, waiting on an image that would request he bring it to life. The steward arrived, but Eshi was nowhere to be found, so the steward went in search of him. Some time later, you are here? Eshi spoke as he walked up the stairs and entered the seventh level. The steward said you had come here looking for me. How goes the investigation? I believe I'm close to solving it, Horo Shah replied. I was wondering if you could help me with a few things. I want to get a feel of this household, so I thought first, I would get a feel of the Gaka family. Tell me about your father and your grandfather. Why do you want to know about them? Eshi inquired. She replied, the painting was created by your grandfather, and I have noticed, so far, that your father has no paintings hanging anywhere within the estate. My grandfather spent a lot of time with his family and still managed to paint hundreds of paintings. His face which had hung sternly like some grim painting, brightened as she spoke of his fond memories, I can remember fishing with him when I was a boy and climbing the nearby mountain, exploring nature. My grandfather had a way with the paint and paper that I envy even to this day. He brought life and vigor to each of his creations from the small snail to the mighty leopard. He breathed life into each of his creations. My paintings seem dead compared to his, as she stated. My father had no gift for painting, and his lack of artistic ability was blamed on the Gaka family curse. Horo Shah said, your housekeeper mentioned something about the curse. Is that why I have seen no paintings created by your sons? It is, as she replied. I have devoted my life to perfecting my own craft so that when they have sons of their own, I might teach their sons our family legacy so that they may carry one the Anamaru style. Are Sora and Itsuki like your father? Do they have no gift for painting? As she thought about the Ranin's question and then answered, Sora has more interest in women and drinking. And Itsuki? I do not know what interests him. She noticed he didn't answer her question but decided not to linger on it and asked instead, do you spend a lot of time in your studio? As she replied, nearly every waking hour if there are no matters for me to attend to. Does your wife like to paint? Does she like to paint? As she thought about it and then answered, Nico does have a gift for calligraphy. She sighed and then said, My calligraphy is atrocious according to my sister. Sakura, Horo Shaw peered at her finger at the paper cut that would scar her forever as the other scars she had received from other would-be takers of her life would scar her forever. One small scar marked her forehead and another her cheek, and she had quite a few of them marking her forearms, but none of them was as important as the paper cut she had received. 
When she was still a baby, her family took in a disgraced priestess named Kekenna. Kekenna was very grateful to her family and very devoted to them. The priestess had been away when the fire and massacre occurred and had returned the next morning and rescued her. The priestess along with the crying samurai raised her. Kekenna had a rare and very special gift of blessing, and the priestess blessed her with a blessing. Horosha called one cut. One cut had been intended to aid Horosha as she sought the one person responsible for killing all of her family. Horosha abandoned her revenge once she discovered her older sister. Sekura was not dead but alive. Horosha smiled as seeing the scar from the paper cut though it was like a double-edged blade. The part of her that was yoke remembered what her sister had tried to do to her not that long ago. She never thought her own flesh and blood would. Rico noticed she was distracted and asked the master of the manor a question of his own. Are you saying you see your family very rarely? Don't you at least have a meal with them once a day? As she looked to the boy and replied, Outside entertaining guests, we have not had a meal together in many, many years. Horosha pulled from her thoughts and said, You should really come out of your turtle tower. My turtle tower? The place you pull into like a turtle who does not want to face the world or the people around it. We are not turtles, Horosha told him. We are humans and we need one another. She thought about her own family and stated, What I have observed of you so far, you have become indifferent to your family or maybe you were always this way and hid it better, but I see a man who is unhappy with the way his paintings have been coming out. The Ronin piqued his curiosity and though claiming to have no artistic talent, the Ronin cast an artist's view on his immediate world. So as she inquired, why would you say that about my paintings? I have not seen one of your works on display. They are all hanging in your studio where no one but you, the housekeeper, and the steward have seen them. Horosha said, maybe if you paid as much attention to your family as you do your work, your paintings will come out more to your liking. How do you mean? You said it yourself when you talked of your grandfather. He spent as much time with his family as he did his work. One must experience life before they can paint it. Horosha informed him as if he hadn't figured out this point on his own. She said this as if it had taken her a long time to figure it out herself circumstances, a restless mind, and a heart-seeking retribution, and justice forced her to grow up faster than any child should. Revenge lingered within her thoughts, but optimism had sprouted in her heart, and she wanted to water the fledgling plant of hope while putting out the flames of retaliation. Horosha thought of this as she said, just like I must taste, see, feel, touch, and learn about the world around me to be a successful detective. She left him with one final thought as she said, think of your grandfather. Did he hide away or did he experience life? Life lessons from tea. Loyalty is like tea. The longer one brews in hot water, the more the flavor of devotion comes out. Chapter 18. More interviews. Around the estate. Horosha interviewed the remaining guards, who were manning their posts at the various guard stations scattered about the estate, and five of them told her that they saw no one that night after 11 p.m. The guard, who manned the south gate that evening, said he saw the steward. He also let in the eldest son and a lady friend of his. The lady friend kissed the eldest son for a long time in the south courtyard. But then she left the estate. Do you report everyone who comes in and out of the gate to Kipa? She questioned the guard at the south gate. I do, the guard replied. And then he made a face as if he just realized something. When he makes his rounds every evening, I report if anyone came or went through the gate. Thank you, she said. You were very helpful. Horosha turned and headed back to the place where they started the investigation. Rico questioned her. Where are we going? Back to the vault, she replied. There is something I would like to check on. Gatto, the guard. Horosha returned to the vault room and found the same guard on duty. First, she walked around the stone table. And next, she went over and inspected the wooden door that led to the vault. And then she questioned him. When I asked you before if you have ever fallen asleep on duty, you hesitated answering me. Was it because your master was here? Did you lie to me? What did you want to tell me but was afraid to say in front of Eshi? I did not lie to you, Gatto replied. It was just, I did fall asleep that night, but I don't remember being tired. I just woke up on the floor. Do you believe you were drugged? I believe it is a strong possibility, Gatto replied. My head was very fuzzy when I did wake. Before you passed out, what was the last time you remember being awake? Gatto replied, I know I was awake at about 1 a.m. I did not regain consciousness until 5 a.m. Horosha turned and headed out of the vault room. Where are we going? Are you going to interview one of the sons? Riku inquired, not sure what Horo had picked up on, but she did have something that she was focusing on. No, she replied. I am going to re-interview someone. Kipa, the head guard. Can you tell me again everyone you saw that night after 11 p.m.? As I said before, besides my own men, I saw the eldest son and the house physician that evening. 
Did you see anyone else or heard of anyone coming onto the estate? Think very carefully. It is very important. I did not, the head guard replied. Near the barracks, Horo Shaw turned and headed toward the manor. She and the boy entered the kitchen courtyard and headed for the gate within the small wall that divided the kitchen courtyard from the area around the front door of the manor. Horo Shaw spotted the kitchen girl coming out of the tiny kitchen and inquired of her, Have you seen Eshi? I have not seen the painter, the kitchen girl replied. The master might be in his office. The cook spoke up as she came out of the tiny kitchen after the girl. And then the cook said, Musum, make that five white radishes instead of four. I hear we will be having guests tonight for the evening meal. The kitchen girl nodded and continued on her way with a basket in hand. The cook turned her attention to Horosha and added, I suppose you're one of them. Do you eat like a horse? Like two, Horosha replied with a grin. Oh, I did want to talk to you about tea. The soul of tea. I find that teacups have a beauty all to their own. An ugly cup cannot take away from the taste of tea but a beautiful one can enhance it. Chapter 19 the name of the culprit is, you know me the handless teacup. You know me was a handless teacup. You know me was a common type of teacup made for daily or informal tea drinking. The cups came in many forms and were usually cylindrical in shape. You know me came in many varieties of pottery styles and the most common styles for you know me were Hagi, Shino, Karatsu, and Mashiko. The manner, at about 3 p.m., Horosha, with a handleless cup of green tea in hand, called through the shoji and when no one answered, she slid the shoji to the side and entered the master's office. They had passed the steward, and he informed them that the master had been in his office about 10 minutes ago. She and Rika waited within the office until Eshi returned almost an hour later. While they waited, she sipped from the Yunomi, indulging in her favorite pastime. Horo Shah's mind drifted as she thought about what might be their next case. She had no idea, but she was eager to go see the town postings chief. The case was probably in this town or maybe a town close by. Her daydreaming was interrupted when Eshi came in. I was about to leave and come look for you, Horosha said when the master of the manor finally showed up. The cook and the steward both said I could find you here. Rico told her, you were only going to leave because you finished your tea and wanted more. She ignored the boy but grinned as he was correct. A matter came up that I had to attend to, Eshi replied and then questioned. Have you already finished interviewing all of the household? I have not interviewed your wife or your two sons, but I believe I do know who stole your grandfather's painting. Horosha answered. Who is it, and how did you discover the culprit so quickly? As she questioned, and then he said, You have not had time to interview any of the people I mentioned who live outside of this household. A member of your household committed the crime. Horosha spoke with certainty. Come with me and let me explain. She turned to the boy and ordered him. Rico, go find the rest of the family and have them meet us at the vault room. Some time later at the vault room. First, let me explain what I believe happened. Horosha began as the master of the manor and Gata looked on. As she questioned, how was the green fish padlock broken into? The lock was never picked and the lock was never opened, she replied. I don't understand, as she said. Please explain. Horosha bided. Come over with me to the vault door. See the hinges here. See how they are on the outside instead of on the inside of the room. The thief merely lifted the door off of its hinges, using some sort of lever. See these marks on the stone floor where something heavy like a boulder had been moved to this point. I believe the stone table was used as a fulcrum to support a lever, but I have not figured out what was used as the lever. If the lever is important to you, I can look into it further. No need, as she replied. We know how they broke into the vault, but who was it and what did they do with the staring feline? As she questioned and then turned to Gatto and gave him an accusing look. Gatto is not the one who stole your painting, Horosha stated with certainty. I believe someone drugged Gatto, perhaps in his meal, before he went on duty and then when he fell asleep, the culprit came in here and had nearly the whole night to remove the door and put it back in place. I believe the theft took place between 1.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. If not Gatto, then who and where is my painting? As she inquired. Please unlock the vault and let me inspect it again. Horosha requested. He took the key and unlocked the green fish padlock, and then the three of them walked into the vault. Horosha walked over to the honeycomb-like shelf, and then she went over and inspected the back of the door that faced the vault. Who would do such a thing? As she questioned for the third time, and where is my painting? A guard rushed into the vault and said, Master, please come with me. There is something urgent that needs your attention. Of course, as she said and then rushed out of the vault. I have everything now, Horosha said with a large grin on her face. She questioned as she had not been paying attention. Where is Eshi? He had to leave on an urgent matter, Gatto replied a little worried about the reason behind the urgent request of the master's presence. Oh. I am ready for the reveal, she said and asked, do you know how long he will be? Gatto replied, I do not. 
Horosha started to get antsy as she wanted to blurt out all she had learned and after a few minutes went by. She said, I should really wait until Ashi returns. He should be the first to discover all that I have found out. She glanced at the door, hoping the master of the manor would return and when he never walked in. She said, I will tell you as long as you promise not to tell your master but allow me to make the reveal. I promise. Good. I know where the painting is and I know who stole it. I will show you where the painting is, but first, she lifted a finger and started to divulge. The one who stole the painting is, Rico burst into the vault and shouted, the head guard. Anticipation haiku. I know the answer. My tongue cannot stand so still. I must blurt all I. Chapter 20. Not exactly the moment she hoped for. The vault. The boy burst in and shouted, the head guard. Rico. Horosha uttered when her moment was taken from her as if a tiger had pounced on a mouse right when the mouse had gotten the cheese. She was upset. No one had ever revealed the culprit before she was able to reveal them. Horosha felt cheated, but she couldn't be mad at the boy. She had never told him how things worked, not that there were set rules for such a thing. Horosha turned to the boy and said, trying not to sound upset. Yes, you are correct, but how did you know? She couldn't help herself and grumbled. I guess you are a smart kid but that doesn't mean you should ruin my moment. One of my favorite parts of solving mysteries is the reveal. How did I know what? Rico asked as he looked terrified as if he might have pounced on a mouse that could swallow a tiger. She was a little confused by his question so she reiterated. How did you know that the head guard stole the painting? How long did you know? You should have told me earlier that you had figured it out. It would have saved me a lot of time, and I could be enjoying the hot springs and another nice cup of tea. Rico looked even more confused than how she felt, and he also appeared white as an apparition as he spoke. I didn't know he. He was the one who stole the painting. Are you sure? I would never have guessed that he was the thief. He is the thief. I started to suspect him when the housekeeper told me she spotted one of the housemaids with one of the guards. She also told me that the head guard usually kept his men in check so why didn't he that night? Why did the head guard also not mention the lady friend the eldest son brought home? If the head guard had done his usual rounds that night, the guard watching the south gate would have reported the woman's entrance and exit of the estate. I believe the head guard was not diligent about his job because he was busy doing other things for about three hours. Without his ever watchful eyes, one of his guards snuck over to see the housemaid. She peered at the boy and then said, how did you know he was the thief? I did not know, Rico admitted as if something serious was on his mind, distracting him from their conversation. She hoped her earlier statements had not been taken as scoldings. Horosha didn't mean them as scoldings. She was just upset that her moment, that she always looked forward to, had been taken from her. The boy kept peering at the wall of the vault room as if he could see into the vault garden that was on the other side. She wasn't sure why he was doing so, and she also realized he had been doing this since he came into the room. It was as if he wanted to tell her something that immediately needed to be said, but he wasn't sure how to just come out and tell her. Her mind went back to their conversation and the boy's statement claiming he didn't know the head guard was the culprit. Now I am very very confused, Horosha spoke. I was in the middle of the reveal when you came barging in here declaring his name. Why would you do such a thing if you didn't already know that he was the thief? You never let me finish. I wasn't declaring him the thief, Rico answered. I was declaring that the head guard was dead. Found murdered. Emotions, she usually kept guarded since the day the fire took everything away. Slapped her in the face. A concussion caused by surprise immobilized her mind for a few moments, and she was stunned to silence. The moment slowly moved forward, and her mind shook off some of the effects so that a little thought returned. Dead. How could Kipa be dead? Her mind was stuck in a mire of bewilderment, and she slowly proceeded through the sludge of uncertainty and astonishment, but the more she thought about it, the more she was pulled into the cosmic perplexing mud of abasement. He was dead. She fell ever deeper into the cerebral quicksand. So Horosha forced her mind to stop thinking of Kipa. She completely abandoned any thoughts pertaining to the head guard and turned her attention elsewhere. Her attention immediately landed on the boy. Horosha now understood his terrified expression. Rico was not afraid that he might have overstepped his part as her apprentice. He was showing signs of post-traumatic shock. The soul of horror. I cannot tell what I am looking at. Something I am seeing is not right, not right by anything natural. Chapter 21. The Thief's Shoe. The Vault. The head guard is in the vault garden, Rico managed to tell her. Her first instinct should have been to help the boy, but Horosha was experiencing her own post-traumatic shock. She turned and rushed out. Horosha, Rico, and even Gatto, abandoning his post, raced out of the vault and through the vault room. The four of them hurried through the west side enclosed walkway that led away from the only entrance into the vault room. Horosha was in the lead when they entered the vault courtyard. 
She immediately turned left and raced to the gate leading into the vault garden. She entered the rock garden and saw three guards standing in the distance along with Eshi. Horosha hurried over to them, staying to the path as not to disturb the currents of gravel. She arrived by their side and peered at the ground as they did. Riko joined her and then Gato. What am I looking at? Horosha questioned as she and the others couldn't take their eyes off of the spot on the ground. A horror rose from the pit of her stomach and increased in its intensity as it neared her mouth as if it would scream forth. The scream never came. Horosha continued to stare at the ground as if she would be frozen in that moment forever. Riko stood beside her as they both gaped at the oddity in the ground. He broke through the seized moment of time and allowed it to flow forward as he answered. The head guard's boots. What is wrong with what I am looking at? Horosha questioned as her mind couldn't wrap itself around what they were looking at. She knew that they were looking at black boots trimmed in red, but it couldn't be possible. She couldn't have allowed a thing to happen. The head guard's shoes are sticking out of a mound of dirt. Rico spoke, not sure how else to explain it. He completed his mission and had no other purpose, so Rico stood there as the horror of the man's death sunk in. She questioned, so that means? Gato replied as the boy had gone mute, by the marks left around his feet in the dirt and gravel. It looks like the head guard was buried alive head first. He turned to one of the guards there and ordered, sound the bell and have the estate sealed. The guard immediately ran off. Are we sure he is dead? Horosha questioned. He could still be. One of the two guards, who had already been in the garden, stated, I grabbed his foot as the other guard began to dig with his hands and well. There was no response. We can all assume. She didn't believe him and went and knelt by the head guard and grabbed his boot. Kipa didn't react to her yanking on his foot. It was as the guard had said. The head guard was dead. I can't believe it, Horosha spoke as a sensation she had never felt before. When dealing with mysteries, made it even harder to think. The bell sounded as two of the guards, who had left to retrieve shovels, re-entered the vault garden and handed a shovel to the two guards who were there. And the four of them started digging out the body. She continued speaking as a sort of panic set in. Someone killed the thief. Why would anyone kill the thief? I had the head guard working alone. Does this mean he had a partner? Horosha considered the possibility and then said, No, I am so sure he worked alone. I don't know, Rico replied. A man is dead. A man has been murdered. And in a horrible and bizarre way, Horosha pointed out as if she had to. The sensation she was experiencing was growing stronger as the horror that had started in the pit of her stomach mingled with the sensation and created a terrifying new beast. She said still in shock, I was here in the estate. I never suspected that someone would kill Kipa. I was here when he was murdered. I could have saved this man if I had only deduced that he was in danger. She reviewed all the details and clues she had observed and heard and went over them all in her mind again. What did I not see? How could I have not foreseen this murder and stopped it? Rico went over, took her hand, and said, This is not your fault. You did not kill this man. Someone else killed Kipa. But I was here, Horosha stated, coming to the defense of herself flogging. I spoke to this man just today. How could I not have foreseen this? I should have deduced that he had a partner, a partner that wanted to silence him. Horo, all you can do now is find justice for this man. You can discover who murdered him, Rico told her as he sensed her great distress over failing to prevent the death. Find justice. She spoke softly. I can find justice for Kipa unlike I was able to find justice for my family. Horosha pushed down the sensation, the terrifying new beast, a sensation of failure and blindness to the presented clues. The boy was right. She couldn't save the head guard, but she could find his murderer. She turned to Gatto and told him, have one of the guards man your post. I want you to come with us as we go to Eshi's office. Horosha turned to the master of the manor and said, our talk should take place in your office. Eshi nodded and immediately headed there. She started to head for the manor when Horosha caught sight of something in the dirt around Kipa's feet. It was a ribbon, a red ribbon made of lace. Horosha unburied the ribbon and took it with her as they headed for the manor. Life lessons from failure. Failure can be a noose, but it can also be a tool. Let it choke you with guilt, and it will hang you. Learn from it, and you can build toward success. Chapter 22 The Meeting in Eshi's Office The Manor It was nearing the evening hour as Horosha, Rico, and Gato sat in front of Eshi, who was sitting behind his desk. They were all silently waiting on the Ronin detective to speak. She found it hard to slay the terrifying new beast or even restrain it, so Horosha found a labyrinth within her mind to keep it in prison long enough that she could focus on the murder. She had just managed to place the beast there when the master at the manor broke the silence. Tell me, who stole my painting? Was it Kipa? It was, Horosha replied. As she spoke, it does not bode well for your reputation to have someone murdered under your watchful eye. His statement was true, but she replied, a man was murdered, 
A man who guarded your family has died and that is all you can say is this might not bode well for my reputation. As she inquired, did Kipa not steal from me? He did. Why do I need to have sympathy for a thief? As she questioned. People who wrong us sometimes have reasons for wronging us. A reason for the misdeed. Don't you want to know why he stole from you? It is enough for me to know that he stole from me, as she replied. I do not need to know the reason. I have more important things to worry about. He questioned the Ronin, do you know where my painting is? Rico was very upset by then, and he started to blurt. Of course. Horosha quickly held out a hand to silence him, and she answered the master of the manor. I have a few ideas about where it can be. She glanced at Gado to see if he would go along with what she was saying. Gado peered at her with this confused look but remained silent. Horosha continued. The case has taken a drastic turn. I am not only trying to determine the whereabouts of the missing painting but now I must solve the murder of Kipa. As she asked, why are you telling me these things as if I do not know already? My verbal contract with you must be changed, she informed him. I see, you want more money. No, Horosha replied. The monetary fee you agreed to with Rico will not change. What will change is my position in your household. Go on, as she spoke. I will have unbridled access to your entire estate and my authority will be second only to you. I need for you to immediately agree to this or I will drop your case and accept the black mark that comes with breaking one of my own rules and the black mark that comes with abandoning a case. As she peered at the Ronin with the eyes of a painter, one who lets no detail go unseen, the Ronin detective had a secret. No, had something that he, she was hiding. He thought about revealing her secret, letting the entire empire know of her true gender. As she debated it some more within the confines of his anger, and then he paused. He had vowed long ago not to let his rage rule him as it had ruled his father. As she took a deep breath and then let it out slowly, Horosha was still the Ronin detective, man or not, and she had several soft cases under her sash. She would have to do since the samurai detective was far away on another case. As she spoke in a calmer voice, I can agree to your first term. You must have at least one more. I do, Horosha replied. I want two members of your household to assist me, and I will pick the two who will work for me while I investigate. Their loyalty must be to me even above their loyalty to you. I can agree to your second term, as she told her. Horosha said, Gado will be one and the other will be determined at a later time. You should appoint another as your acting head guard while Gado assists me. No need, as she replied. I trust he can run my guards and still assist you. Horosha nodded. Do you have a third condition? As she questioned. Not at this time, but I insist on the right to stipulate this third condition if the situation arises. Done, as she replied. Now find my painting. I need to inform the town magistrate of the murder. Horosha started out, and then she paused and asked the master of the manor, did you ever suspect that Kipa had stolen the painting? Or maybe you overheard me tell Gado and Rico. What if I did? As she inquired. In that case, you would be my prime suspect? Horosha answered and gauged Eshi's reaction which was one of notable irritation, but not guilt, and then she turned and headed out as Rico, and Gado followed her. Gado asked once they left the office and were walking through the main hall, why did you tell the master you had not found the painting? As she doesn't care about who killed Kipa, he only cares about the painting. It might be the only thing he really cares about. I care who murdered Kipa, and I will solve this new mystery or I do not deserve to be the great Ronin detective. T Haiku? T. I thirst for joy. Nothing else compares to you. Fire up my mind. Chapter 23. A new direction in the investigation. The main hall. Rico questioned Horosha as they continued walking toward the front door. Do you have any idea who could have killed Kipa? No, not even a clue, she admitted. I must interview everyone again. We go to the kitchen first. Gatto, make sure the guards have sealed the estate. None may go and none may enter except for the town magistrate. Once that is done, see if everyone is accounted for. The murderer could have fled. If anyone is missing, immediately report to me. If everyone is accounted for, go see to the removal of the head guard's body. Have him laid out on the ground beside the hole along with anything that might be discovered upon his unearthing. Gatto nodded and went on his way. Some time later, Rico and Horosha paused some distance from the tiny kitchen. Why have we stopped? The boy questioned. The kitchen girl passed them going into the tiny kitchen. She was eating a strawberry and carrying a basket full of white radishes. The kitchen girl tossed the strawberry stem before going in. I am thinking again about the evidence we have been collecting, Horosha told him. Go find the steward and request a satchel we might have. I am going to put you in charge of safeguarding the large items like the piece of lacquer bamboo I'm holding. It will be a very important job to safeguard the clues. Rico nodded and hurried off to find the steward. It didn't take him too long. 
and he shortly returned. They entered the tiny kitchen and found the cook with her arms folded, peering down at the kitchen girl who was sitting cross-legged on the floor. A basket of white radishes was sitting in front of her, and the kitchen girl was preparing them to be cooked. The cook scolded, Musum, look at your nails. Go scrub them before you handle any more of the food. You should wash your hands after being in the garden digging. Rico leaned to Horosha and whispered, Look, the kitchen girl has dirt all over her hands. Could she have dug the hole that entombed Kipa? She whispered back, A hole deep enough for Kipa's height would have been dug by a shovel, not by hand or it would have taken too long and have been discovered. Her nails are dirty from her radish digging. And besides, Musum just arrived on the estate today. She would not have been involved in the theft of the painting and so could not have been Kipa's accomplice, but maybe we should be sure of it. Komi, the cook turned as the two of them entered, and the cook griped, What do you want? Tell me your whereabouts for the last two hours, Horosha requested. She glanced at one of the few clocks on the estate and added, It would have been between 3.20 p.m. and 5.25 p.m. I've been here, the cook answered. Can anyone verify it? Horosha inquired. Musum has been in and out. Also, the housekeeper was here over two hours ago. I believe it was around 3.35 p.m. What about you? Horosha began as she questioned the kitchen girl. Musum turned, looked over the ranan, laughed, and then said, I heard a great detective was here. One from a samurai family, but I see you. You are not Lord Tante, the great samurai detective. Horosha felt her face redden with anger as the girl, who was only slightly older than her, mocked her. Usually, her emotions didn't attain the better of her, but the shock over Kipa's death left her less guarded over them. She needed to do something about them or she would be useless as a detective. Life lessons from tea. Anger is like boiling tea. It is hot and can burn, so it is best to handle with care. Chapter 24. Restraining her emotions. The tiny kitchen. After taking a moment to once again restrain her emotions, Horosha peered at the kitchen girl who had just insulted her. Horosha had been insulted by many over the last year as the Ronan detective. She was too young. She was too inexperienced. She was. She was a woman. Horosha never let those things bother her before or at least outwardly showed that they bothered her. She grew accustomed to expecting the ridicule but with Kipa dying under her usually observant eyes, everything stung more. Even the kitchen girl's words. You avoided the question, Horosha said once she pulled herself together. Are you guilty of something? I am guilty of many things, Musum replied from her seated position on the floor. The older girl stared at the ranan, trying to figure out something about the disgraced samurai. Musum knew there was something, but she couldn't work out what it was just yet. She wasn't about to give up as she said. I have mostly been here in the kitchen. I went to the vegetable garden and dug up white radishes and then came back here. Where is the vegetable garden located? Horosha questioned. Right next to the orchard, Musum half answered with a mischievous grin. I knew the moment I laid eyes on you that you would be a troublesome girl. The cook spoke and then told the ranan. The orchard and the vegetable garden are both located in the back of the estate in between the grain warehouse that is in the northwest corner and the tool storage house. Horosha questioned, what is next to the tool storage house? The vault building, the cook replied. Horosha questioned the kitchen girl, did you immediately come back once you dug up the radishes? No, Musum answered, glanced at the cook, and then replied, I took my time walking back, and I also wandered around the estate. Did you see anyone on your stroll? Horosha asked. Five people, the kitchen girl replied. Lady Evening Vanilla, the thief and mistress of the household on my way to the vegetable garden, and the young fox and the painter on my wanderings. Those names, Horosha began as she tilted her head, thinking about what the kitchen girl said. You have created your own names for many of the household. The cook grumbled. I told her how rude it was to do so, but she does not listen to me. Horosha thought some more on the small puzzle presented before her and said, the painter is Eshi. The mistress of the household could be Emery, the housekeeper, and the thief is Kipa. Hum, the young fox could be one of the sons, and Lady Evening Vanilla. I am not sure. I have just arrived today and do not tell me the great Ronan detective cannot figure this out. The kitchen girl spoke. I heard you arrived before me and I should be able to figure this out. Horosha spoke, finding she was grumbling this time. You said Lady so Lady Evening Vanilla would be Gaka Nico. Am I right? You are. Why do you call her Lady Evening Vanilla? Horosha questioned. I have never smelled vanilla around her. I have walked by her room within the manor several times already and have smelled a perfume of hers, the kitchen girl explained. Oh, so, Horo, you have gotten off track, Rico pointed out in a whisper, knowing her mind couldn't ignore a puzzle even if it had nothing to do with their case. 
I have gotten off track, she agreed. Horosha put the puzzle aside and said to Musum, You saw five people, and they were Mistress Nico, Kipa, and the housekeeper on your way to the vegetable garden. Let me guess that you saw the youngest son, Itsuki, and Eshi on your wanderings. Do I have this correct? The kitchen girl nodded. You saw the head guard, Horosha began and then asked, would this be the head guard who was murdered or do you speak of Gato? He was the one who went swimming in the dirt. The kitchen girl replied as she giggled. Musum, the cook scolded her. You should not speak of the dead in such a way. I was only answering the Ronin's question. Horosha asked, where did you see Mistress Nico and at what time? I saw Lady Evening Vanilla near the tool storage house, Musum answered. It was sometime before 5 p.m. I had dug up two radishes and needed a break, so I explored the buildings that were closest to the garden. Horosha thought about the time and asked, I don't believe there are any clocks in the buildings over there. How did you know the time? There is a clock somewhere in the center of the estate that I can hear chime. It had not chimed yet. It might have been 4.50 p.m. She would have heard the barracks clock. The cook spoke up. It is located in the barracks courtyard. It was set up there so that all the guards could hear the time and change shifts as needed. You can barely hear it inside a building, but you can hear it anywhere on the estate if you are outside. Horosha questioned the kitchen girl. Where did you see Emery, the housekeeper, and at what time? I saw the mistress of the household walking into the orchard from my spot in the vegetable garden. A small fence separates the orchard and garden so even though I was kneeling, I could see her. It was at 5 p.m. I know this for I did hear the clock chiming. Where did you see the head guard? I saw him before I saw Lady Evening Vanilla, the kitchen girl replied. He was heading toward the vault building. I don't know the exact time. The soul of tea. I breathed in and I breathe out. Tea has such splendid aromas when my soul needs them. Chapter 25. Scents and Clues. The tiny kitchen. The aroma of the next meal filled the small area as Horosha considered the people and the places and times the kitchen girl had seen them. She smelled fish and rice cooking, and a hint of ginger and garlic permeated the air. Her mouth watered as she considered everything she had heard and decided she would speak to the housekeeper and the mistress of the manor next once she finished interviewing the cook and kitchen girl. She noticed Rico holding the satchel, so she gave him the lacquer bamboo stick and red ribbon to hang on to. She questioned the kitchen girl, where did you see the youngest son and at what time? The young fox? Hum, I am not sure of the time. I believe I saw him before I went to the garden. I saw him going into a building that is against the west wall and next to the grain warehouse. I believe she is talking about the paper mill, the cook stated. During the spring and early summer, the paper, the estate uses for the year, is created there. Seasonal workers are hired to create what we will need. The work was finished about two weeks ago. Horosha inquired, is the paper used in the Anamaru style of watercolor also created in this paper mill? The cook answered, yes, special artisans are brought in to create the special type of onion skin paper used in the paintings. Horosha questioned the kitchen girl, where and when did you see Eshi? I saw the painter after I finished digging up the other three white radishes. It was a short time after 5 p.m. Maybe it was 5.15 or 5.20 p.m. Horosha considered all she had learned and while she was doing so, Rico decided to try his hand at questioning and stretching his mental muscle. So he asked the cook, why was the housekeeper here and how long did she stay? Emery was here about 20 minutes. She had come to inform me that she heard we would be having guests tomorrow or the next day. The master's uncle and his new wife will be coming to stay for a few weeks. The uncle has certain dietary needs, so she wanted me to make a special menu for him. Now, if you will excuse me, I have an errand I must run. The cook left the tiny kitchen. Horosha once again considered everything she had heard and seen, and then she said, Musum, you have lied to me. You saw at least one other person on your wanderings. The kitchen girl peered at the Ronin, not in anger at the accusation but in pleased surprise. Musum said, I was also lied to. I was told you were from some samurai family, but you are a Ronin, a samurai with no master, a disgraced warrior. You might carry a sword but you are far from a great samurai. Horosha was no longer angry with what the kitchen girl was saying. Horosha was listening to the little things that Musum did not say. The girl, who was slightly older than her, was harsh but so must have been the life she had led up to that point. Musum couldn't help herself and asked, How do you know that I met at least one other person? The strawberry you were eating. It is a very expensive treat, and I believe Mistress Nico's favorite snack. You must have come across the housemaid who was put in charge of picking up and delivering the strawberries to the mistress. I could have snuck in Lady Evening Vanilla's room and stole one or I could have stolen one while the cook was preparing them. Musum said. 
I believe you wouldn't sneak into the mistress room to steal a strawberry. I also don't believe you stole one while the cook was preparing them. Komi is very observant and would not have allowed you to get away with eating one. She lets you get away with other things but not something that the mistress might miss. The kitchen girl asked, what are you saying? The mutual fondness you have developed for one another in the short time you have been here has, well, given you an opportunity to find a family, a place to belong, fondness. The kitchen girl repeated as she laughed. Horosha noticed a smile she had seen before as she stated, yes, a fondness. All she does is yell at me, Musum insisted as if she had the answer and not the Ranan. She yells at you so that you will improve. I believe Komi sees her free-spirited daughter in you or maybe her son. If this was not true, she would have fired you by now. You are lazy and do as little as possible when it comes to your job? Why would the cook put up with such things? Musum thought about it and was going to argue the point but the cook returned. The kitchen girl stared at the older woman in a way she had never done before. Musum, I will finish the radishes. Go and bring in some more wood, the cook ordered. The kitchen girl immediately stood up and raced out the exit. Komi questioned the Ranan, what got into her? I didn't have to tell her three times. Horo chagrined but only shrugged, and then she also turned and headed out of the tiny kitchen. Rico followed after her, but then she upped and stopped just outside. She started thinking again. Why did you ask the cook and kitchen girl where they were for the past two hours? The boy inquired. It is the window of time I believe the murderer dug the hole and killed Kipa. She replied, paused once more in thought, and said, the head guard was killed sometime after we last saw him. Hum, we do not know how he was killed for sure until his body has been dug up. We should have enough time to interview another group of people before that grim task is completed. I will interview the housekeeper next and then. What is bothering you? Rico interrupted. You are a very clever and observant boy, she told him and then answered. The hole. How could one person dig a hole that deep in less than two hours? I am missing something. The small clock in the kitchen started to chime. It is now 6.30 p.m. We have much to do in the next hour before dark, Horosha said. Tea haiku? Round and round it goes. My apt mind cannot stand stall. Green tea will calm it. Chapter 26. The Dead Cherry Tree. Near the servants' quarters. Rico and Horosha headed to find the housekeeper and came across the steward. Excuse me, Hakairo? Do you have any work going on in the vault garden? The steward replied, I do. A cherry tree had died, so I had one of the male servants dig it up today. It was a miniature version of the tree so the roots didn't run too deep. Do you know if he filled in the hole once he was done? He did not, the steward replied. A new cherry tree is supposed to arrive in the next few days. I told the male servant to stake up ribbons around the hole so no one would hurt themselves. The ribbon, Horosha repeated. She considered the item, then went to her next question and asked, what can you tell me about Kipa before he came to work here? Were you here when he first came to work for the Gaka family? I was, the steward replied. She waited on him to answer the other question and when he didn't, Horosha repeated, what can you tell me about Kipa before he came to work here? The steward peered at the Ranan for a few moments as if debating something, and then he answered, I cannot say. You cannot say as you do not know or you cannot say because someone has ordered you to keep quiet about Kipa's past. The steward didn't reply. I take it the latter is correct, but who told you to keep quiet? I don't think it was the master of the manor. It could have been one of the two sons or the housekeeper. She stated, searching for a reaction. The mistress of the manor could have. Horosha found the reaction she was waiting for and stated, Why would Gaka Nico order you not to talk about Kipa's past? The steward looked worried as if he had betrayed the mistress even though he had kept silent. You are a good servant, Horosha told him to reassure him. And you care about the Gaka family and this household. You also seem like a man of integrity since you did not outright lie. Do not worry. You did not betray your mistress. She turned and headed off as she said. Come, Rico? The boy asked as they walked. What is it? I believe we can now remove the red ribbon from our list of clues. Its mystery has been solved. It is no longer a list then, the boy commented. The bamboo stick is the only thing on it. Horosha thought about Kipa's past and why it needed to be kept a secret. And she stated, I imagine the list will grow just as tea leaves grow in the spring and summer. Life lessons from tea. Even darkness falls on tea leaves. Chapter 27. The near quiet of evening. The manor. It was quiet as the hours of the evening were starting to set in. Horosha didn't hear any servants about as she and Rico entered through the front door and walked all the way to the end of the main hall. They passed the steward's office, turned left, and paused at the entrance to the housekeeper's office. The shoji was open, and the housekeeper was within. Come in, the housekeeper bided them. Imari, can you tell me what you were doing between 3.35pm and 5.25pm today? Horosha questioned as she entered. 
The housekeeper answered the Ronin. I went and spoke to the cook about guests we will be having in a day or two. And then I returned to my office. Mistress Nico wanted to meet me at the orchard at 4.45 p.m. to discuss the new guests, so I busied myself with some bookkeeping and then headed for the orchard. I arrived at the orchard on time. About five minutes later, the new kitchen girl, who was in the vegetable garden, told me she saw the mistress near the tool storage house. I went there and saw the mistress go into the building. I followed her in. We talked about the guests and made arrangements for which of the empty residents they would stay in and which housemaid would take over duties for that residence while they are here. What was the mistress doing in the tool storage house? It looked like she was inspecting a shovel, the housekeeper replied. Some time later, the Ronin learned of the location of Gaka Nico and walked to the residence of the house physician, Samba. The house physician's residence was located in the northeast corner of the estate. Horosha and Rico walked right in. Red Clover Residence. Gaka Nico, tell me your whereabouts between 3.25 p.m. and 5.25 p.m. The mistress was sitting in a chair while the house physician performed acupuncture on her face and arms. The mistress had her eyes closed and didn't open them. You came in unannounced, Nico spoke. Horosha turned and looked around. And then she said, there is no one here to announce us. I will forgive you this one time, Nico replied and opened her eyes. And then she answered the Ronin's question. I was in the Koi Garden from 3 p.m. until about 4.30 p.m. It is located next door. I enjoy feeding the fish and sitting in the stillness of nature. I planned on staying for another hour, but the housekeeper wanted to meet me in the orchard. What happened when you arrived at the orchard? Horosha questioned. I never arrived. I came across a shovel in the vault courtyard as I made my way to the orchard. I didn't want anyone to trip over it, so I picked it up and put the shovel in the tool storage house, and by the time I finished, the housekeeper came in. We had our meeting there. We were there until we heard the bell to seal the estate. Horosha paid close attention to the mistress reaction as she asked, did you know Kipa before he came to work on this estate? Samba yelled, how dare you ask the mistress a question that implies? I am not implying anything, Horosha interrupted. No, that is a lie. I am implying that. She turned her attention away from the house physician and focused on Nico as she continued, dot 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 you do not want me to discover something about Kipa's past. Horosha paused, trying to gauge her reaction but there was nothing to gauge, so she asked, who was Kipa before he came to work for your family? Samba, I am tired, Nico spoke. The house physician moved over to the Ronin, crossed her arms, and said, I believe it is time that you left. The mistress needs her rest. She started to protest when someone called out her name. Horosha, Gato shouted. He waited until the house physician bided him in, and then he came in and said, we finished unburying Kipa and have removed most of the dirt from his body without washing the body. She turned to the mistress and informed her, I will continue this interview once I have looked over Kipa. Horosha turned to Gado and said, let me examine the body. I believe I am starting to see the hot water turn into tea. The three of them left. The Ronin is a ruffian, the house physician said as she rolled up her sleeves as if she would chase after Horosha and give him a good beating. I believe you are more of a ruffian than the Ronin, Nico stated, forcing a laugh not to slip through her lips. Samba gave up on her anger and went and washed her hands in a bowl of water. She dried them and then returned to her mistress' side. Samba said, we should be wary of the detective. Nico closed her eyes once again and told her, the Ronin is a very interesting character, but I do feel as though he is hiding something from all of us. Samba asked, would this something he is hiding possibly hurt you in any way? No, Nico replied. I feel as though this secret is harmless and it is more of an omission than a secret. I believe in our next meeting I will discover what he is purposely excluding. T haiku. Bamboo strikes a stone. T flowers the summer air. Bamboo strikes again. Chapter 28. Fountains and town magistrates. Shishiodoshi. Shishiodoshi or bamboo tube fountain was a type of water fountain that consisted of a segmented tube made of bamboo. They were first created to frighten animals away from the garden but then became a part of garden style throughout the empire. The tube of bamboo moved up and down. When it was empty, its heavier end was down and rested against a rock. Water trickling and accumulated in the upper part of the tube and once it was heavy enough, the accumulated water caused the tube to dump out the water. The heavier end would then fall back against the rock and make a sharp sound, and the cycle would repeat. The bamboo tube fountain broke the quietness of any garden and yet brought a tranquilness all its own. Enforcement of the Emperor's Law A town magistrate was the head police officer over each town, and they were second in authority over law enforcement and punishment. The governor was the only one who could outrank a decision made by them, but governors rarely meddled in the enforcement of the law. 
The town magistrates were under the authority of the province magistrate who held his power under the samurai lord. The region magistrate, who held his power under the overlord, had authority over the province magistrates. Lawyers did not exist in the Kenjin Empire, but advocates could represent a person who was sent before a judge, who in small towns, was the town magistrate. The soul of tea. I linger on tea as it fills my thoughts and lips with its dark brew. Oh, that I never run out. Chapter 29. Looking over the next set of clues. The vault garden. Gato informed the Ron and once the three of them stood before the head guard. It looks like Kipa was hit over the head, gagged, and then buried. Horosha examined the body and said, but was he dead when he was buried or was he buried alive? She checked the body's nose and found that the head guard had inhaled dirt. Horosha removed the gag which was a silk scarf, and three silver coins fell out of his mouth. Are they coins for the ferryman? Gato questioned. I hear that a Western religion believes one needs to pay a boatman to take them to the afterlife. I have also heard of this, but they use one or two coins that are usually placed on the eyes. I have never heard of them using three or silver coins. Horosha spoke. There may be another meaning behind the coins. Did you find anything in the dirt or on the body? Just this, Gato replied as he handed the Ron in a dirt-covered earring. Horosha took the earring and then went and washed it in a nearby bamboo tube fountain. The earring was of a carp-shaped streamer and made of silver. She moved back over to Gato and asked him, Do you recognize this earring? He remained silent. You know, tell me who this belongs to. The mistress of the manor, Gato replied. I still need to re-interview her, Horosha stated. It looks like I will be doing it much sooner. Gato, clean the dirt from the head guard and prepare him for burial and then take his body to the vault room. It is cool in there. I may need to examine his body again, and the guard who is guarding the vault can make sure no one disturbs his body. Horosha turned and left the vault garden as Rico followed her. She was back on the hunt like a tiger who would not relent in her pursuit. The prey was close. All she had to do was pick up their scent. Life lessons from tea. One could paint with tea but that would be a waste. It is better to color water with other things less tasty. Chapter 30. Scheme of the Painting. The Vault Courtyard. I see you, Rico spoke as he caught up to the distracted Ronan. I see you, Horo. She paused, turned to him, and asked, What do you mean? The Horo Shai first met at the postings. You are back, the you who will not let a mystery go unsolved. I do feel a little better now that I see a pattern. She told the boy. What do you see? Rico questioned. Someone is painting a picture for us, Horo Shai answered as her light green eyes lit up with the excitement of the mental hunt. They are creating a picture stroke by stroke, image by image. What bothers me is that I see so little of the painting right now. I see only wisps of images. Rico closed his eyes also trying to see the painting Horo spoke of. He could almost make out what she was seeing, but it was shrouded by darkness. She stated as she peered at the earring, we have to only figure out where these items fit in the scheme of the painting. Rico opened his eyes and asked, what do you mean? Maybe everything we are seeing is a symbol for something. Horo Shah replied, the earring is of a carp, the magnificent koi, and the carp or koi is a highly respected and very symbolic fish that is closely tied to the empire's identity. It is also a symbol of luck, prosperity, and good fortune. I don't know that any of those three is what the murderer is wanting us to see. Us? Rico repeated. You keep referring to us when you speak of the killer and what he is doing. Hum. She spoke as Horo Shah pulled from her deep thoughts. Us? Yes, I have been. When I say us I mean anyone who is paying attention. A painting can be created for one's own enjoyment but this concealed painting's brush strokes are out for anyone to see. She re-entered her thoughts as she spoke. But why create the painting? Is it being created to be seen so that the murderer will eventually be revealed? Why reveal the artist and the subject, the reason for the murder? Why point it out? Why not just kill the head guard and be done with it? There's so much here that I can't see. Maybe I need to stop standing so far back, trying to see the entirety of the painting. Maybe I need to move in closer and look at something small. She removed a silk handkerchief from her kimono and placed the three silver coins in it and the earring. Horosha gave the gag that had been tied around Kipa's mouth to Rico so the boy would put it in his satchel. She peered at the four items she held, then focused on one of the items, and said, Luck, prosperity, and good fortune. I can't see how any of those fit the earring. The fish must have another meaning. It is actually a carp-shaped streamer, Rico corrected as he peered at the earring in the silk handkerchief. You are correct, Horosha said as she took another look. Maybe we should focus on what this streamer could symbolize. What about Tango no Seku, Boy's Day? I have never heard of this, she stated and then asked. What is it? You haven't heard of the festival? Rico inquired, surprised by the fact. There are two festivals that celebrate children and one of them is called Tango no Seku and is a festival for boys. 
Are you sure you haven't heard of Boys Day or what about Hinamatsuri? Girls Day. She shook her head. I would have thought your family would have celebrated. Maybe they did. Horosha interrupted him as her gaze became distant and reminiscent of a life taken from her. A life she could never get back. I was so young when the fire destroyed my home and my father and brother died. I was only five at the time. Horosha remained in her thoughts for a long while as she remembered how happy her family was. And then she pulled from them and asked, Why did you bring up Tango no Seku? Riko knew so little about Horo's past and what had happened to her family. She only recently discovered that her sister, Sakura, was actually alive and had not perished in the fire that drastically changed her life so long ago. Tango no Seku celebrates boys, and families with boys fly huge carp-shaped streamers called Koinobori outside the house and display dolls of famous warriors and other heroes inside. You and your family must have celebrated, she said as she saw the gleam in his eyes when Rico spoke of the festival. He frowned when she pointed it out and changed the subject by saying, maybe the earring has something to do with boys' day. Rico's pain was similar to her own pain, so she didn't press the issue and moved their conversation forward by saying, I will keep Tango no Seku in mind. Horosha turned her attention to the three other things on the handkerchief and said, The silver coins were placed in the mouth. If not for the ferryman, could it be a payoff for the head guard's silence over something or a payoff for something that he had done or both? The soul of tea. I watch as the ebony sky approaches. Soon it will be time to drink again. Chapter 31. Emerald Dragon Empress Tea. The Vault Courtyard. Night was approaching as the Ronin left. They had less than an hour of light left. Horosha was not familiar enough with the estate to do an investigation at night, and she was also growing tired. She had Rico go in search of the housekeeper so that she might show him where they would be lodging. Horosha reminded him of the conditions of their employment there and to make sure before he left their lodging that everything had been set up, including a meal. Horosha walked alone to the back northeast corner of the estate. The Gaka estate was very large, not as large as her family's castle estate. She paused beside a willow tree and closed her eyes, listening to the sounds of the day as it departed and to the sounds of the approaching night. She continued to her destination and discovered Nico had left the residence of the house physician. Actually, no one was there. Horosha turned and headed to the manor, not upset at all. Her stroll would be lengthened. She arrived at the manor some time later. Horosha explored much of the area around the main hall. Most of the rooms on the left side, as one entered the manor through the front door, were empty. She did come across a room directly across from the shoin, also known as the drawing room. That was as large. The room was full of paintings, she guessed, that were by past and present Gaka family members. She also guessed that she was in the painting room the housekeeper had spoken of. Horosha walked around the painting room and noticed a few interesting things as she examined the paintings. She left the room and started on the right side of the main hall and explored those rooms. The room on the other side of the showing closest to the front door was a sitting room. She opened the shoji and went in. The mistress of the manor and the house physician were inside enjoying some tea. Nico looked up when the ronin slid the shoji to the side and just entered without an escort or any word. And Nico questioned without raising her voice, Why have you entered unannounced? You also did so when you entered Samba's residence. I was deep in thought and didn't hear anyone in here. Horosha replied as if she was a child trying to figure out an excuse. I could go look for the steward or the housekeeper. She looked behind herself as she added, I haven't seen anyone since I sent the boy to look for the housekeeper. A certain kitchen girl gave me an idea, and I have been wandering about your grand estate. She took another step into the sitting room and the most amazing aroma hit her. Horosha immediately recognized the heavenly scent. It was the elusive emerald dragon empress tea which was a blend of sencha and Ceylon black tea combined with marigold, violet, rose, and guava. She rushed over to the table the two women were sitting at and saw the dry leaf blend sitting in a bowl. The potpourri-like mixture was truly beautiful with its dried purple violet, pink rose, and yellow marigold flowers along with scattered dried golden amber guava pieces against the darker tea leaves. Horosha nearly squealed out in glee. She was very distracted as she stated, I am re-interviewing everyone and as I said before, I have some special questions for you. She glanced at the tea after recognizing the familiar scent and asked, already knowing the answer, is that Emerald Dragon Empress tea? It is, Nico replied. I would offer you some but since you showed no manners entering unannounced, I will show no manners that are customary in hospitality. Horosha realized the great treasure she had missed because of her unthoughtfulness, and she unconsciously pouted. Nico noticed this and grinned. The tiny trap, she was hoping to spring on the run and to discover his harmless secret, had sprung early. Nico knew Horosha's omission. She only had to decide what to do with this harmless secret. 
Horoshaw thought about what the mistress had told her and spoke, I apologize for my rudeness and will make every effort in the future to respect your position in this household. Do you believe I should now offer you tea? Nico questioned her, tempting the one whose tiny secret she had learned. I do not, Horoshaw replied. My penance for my rudeness. She sighed as she continued, dot 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 and such a heavy and grievous punishment it is. If you had not noticed, tea is a vice of yours, Nico interrupted her. You are starting to know me, Horoshaw said with a grin. But maybe vice is not the right word. Tea is a passion of mine. Bear your punishment, Nico told the Ronin. If you should return my husband's painting to him, maybe I will reward you with some Emerald Dragon Empress tea. A reward to greatly look forward to, Horoshaw spoke. And with that said, if you will grant me, I will proceed with my questions. Nico nodded. She had discovered a secret belonging to the Ronin. Would Horoshaw uncover what the mistress was hiding? Tea Haiku, elusive dragon, flying by with roar and grin. Emerald Tea Wish. Chapter 32. The three silver coins in the carp earring. The sitting room. The Emerald Dragon Empress Tea's heavenly scent continued to attack Horoshaw's nose with a reminder of what she had lost. She kept eyeing the cups the two women were sipping from. Horoshaw dreamed of one day having the tea again. Before I question you about Kipa, can you tell me a little about your sons? Horoshaw inquired, forcing her mind as much as she could from her loss. Sora is a bully and takes all that he can get out of life over the expense of others. His greatest strength and weakness is that he sees what he wants and goes after it. He has a hidden talent that he uses only when he sees it will gain him wealth. Sora could be so much more. Sora is so much more if only someone would guide him to his potential. Nico replied, and then she stated, Itsuki does not stand up for himself, and it comes across as cowardly. He is very smart and has a way with numbers that is brilliant, but his talent is also ignored. Though, it is my hope that he has discovered his talent and is nurturing it on his own. You sound like you deeply care for these men who are not your true sons, Horoshaw stated. They are my sons in my eyes, Nico stated with immense motherly conviction. I have been restricted from showing it, but I deeply care for each of them as if they were my birth sons. I only wish I had more say in their growth and development. So, true sons or not, they are my sons. The house physician turned and peered at the mistress with compassion as she made the statement. Horosha thought she also saw a tear come to Samba's eye. Thank you for being honest with me, Horosha said. You have painted a more complete picture of your family. A picture I did not see before and with that said, I need to ask you some questions about the head guard. Horoshaw stated as she removed the handkerchief and showed the mistress of the manor and the head physician the four items. A few items were found on Kipa's body. Do you recognize any of them? Horoshaw could tell that they both recognized something and most likely it was the earring. The house physician answered, we recognize none of those things. Please, do not lie to me. And when I say lie, I also mean keeping silent when a lie is told. How dare you? The house physician snapped. I will have Kipa come in here and... Her face flushed as she had spoken the name of a dead man. She corrected herself by saying, I mean Gato. I will have Gato come in here and... It is fine, Samba, Nico said. The house physician quieted herself when the mistress spoke her name. Nico stated, I imagine the Ronin has already learned that the earring belongs to me. I have, Horosha admitted. As I had said, the items were found on his body. The three silver coins were found in his mouth. She waited for some sort of reaction from the two women, and Horosha did detect a slight hint of surprise from the mistress and a deeper shock from the house physician. The three silver coins seemed to mean something to Samba. But what about the earring? Did it have any other significance than that it belonged to the mistress? I believe these items have some sort of meaning behind them, Horosha began. For now, I believe the coins show that Kipa was paid to do something and keep quiet about it. The house physician's eyes widened, and Horosha doubted Samba would tell her why she reacted in this way even if she asked her. Nico never reacted to the news. I also believe the carp earring means something. My apprentice, Rico? Horosha said as she glanced at the boy who seemed to know his name was called and walked through the shoji on queue. Rico smiled when she called him her apprentice, and she was very pleased that he was very pleased. Horosha continued, believes the earring might refer to Tango no Seku. Boy's Day. Samba reacted only slightly when the bribe was mentioned but when Tango no Seku was spoken, the house physician looked ill as if a sudden bout of guilt had afflicted her. Horosha studied Nico's reaction, and she didn't seem to have any as if the house physician was the only one who held on to this secret. 
Horoshaw also figured out something else. Nico and Samba didn't want the others of the household to know, but they were inseparable. Samba took care of the mistress as if she was her younger sister. They were very close, so it was curious. Most curious that Samba would have a secret that Nico didn't know. Life lessons from tea. Secret ingredients work for tea, but secrets in life can haunt one until their dying day. Chapter 33. The Deputy of the Town Magistrate. The Sitting Room. Guilt. There was no doubt about it. Samba had reacted only slightly when the bribe was mentioned by the Ranan, but when Horosha spoke of the Tango no Seku, the house physician looked stricken by an illness of guilt. Horosha was about to ask her about it when the steward entered the sitting room. Mistress, a deputy of the town magistrate has come, and the master has requested that you greet him as the master is busy with his work. Eshi, do not hide away from the world. Nico spoke softly, and then she said, have the deputy come? The deputy of the town magistrate entered and greeted the mistress. Horosha and Rico moved to the side so that the man could talk to the mistress. Nico asked, why have you come without the town magistrate? My husband requested him as the situation warrants his expertise. The town magistrate went up to the temple on the mountain. He will be at least another day or two before he returns. Is there anything I can help you with? Nico started to reply, but then she turned to the Ranan and said, Horosha, please excuse me while I speak with the deputy. I still need to ask you about Kipa's past before he came to work for your family. Samba got angry and said, the mistress has asked you to leave. Are you refusing? Horosha was about to protest, but decided against it, and said instead, I will leave, but I will return. She thought of how the mistress had been treating her the last few minutes and added, I will leave the boy behind the next time we speak. Maybe you will feel more comfortable speaking. She glanced at the steward and deputy and said, when there are no men around. Horosha paused for a few seconds, turned, and left as Rico followed her out. Nico took a good look at the Ranan before Horosha left as her guess was confirmed. She looked forward to the Ranan's return but right now, she needed to get rid of the deputy. Do you know why the town magistrate was summoned? Nico inquired. I do not, the deputy replied. I was only told to come. What has happened? Why did you need to see the town magistrate? You will have to ask my husband, Nico replied. It must not be that important since he did not see you when you arrived. You can go, have the town magistrate come when he returns from the temple. Nico told him. The deputy nodded, then turned, and left. The steward followed him out. The house physician waited a few moments, and then she questioned, Why did you not tell the deputy about the murder of the head guard? I must figure out something before we involve the town magistrate or any of his deputies. Nico replied, Who could have put the coins in Kipa's mouth and what do they have to do with the missing painting? I heard it from the housekeeper that the Ranan believes Kipa stole the painting. I can only think of one time that three silver coins were ever used. It might be best that we not speak of this when we are not sure we are completely alone, Samba suggested. You are correct as always. We do need to keep an ever watchful eye on the Ranan. She may be getting too close to a moment better left buried. I will follow the Ranan and keep an eye on him and the bee. Samba spoke, paused, and asked, did you say she? Yes, Samba, I do believe that the Ranan is actually a young woman, Nico stated. The Ranan herself confirmed it before she left as if Horosha guessed I had discovered her. Omission. How do you know she is a woman? Nico put her hand over her mouth as she chuckled, and then she replied, Did you see how she pouted when I refused her any of the tea? I see now. Not your usual reaction from a samurai. Masterless or not? Nico spoke. Maybe Horosha senses my disdain for most men and thought I would be more open to speaking to a fellow female. If she is a woman, she is a fraud and maybe you should inform the master. No, Nico answered. We will not tell my husband. Let him figure it out himself. Anyway, I want to see if this young woman has as apt of a mind as she boasts and finds the painting. Though, I do take the risk that she will uncover my closely guarded secret. You should not take the risk, Nico, and I will make sure the Ranan does not tarnish your name. The mistress said nothing for a few moments as she considered the new situation she was in, and then Nico said, and as for the Ranan being a fraud, I never remember her telling us she was a young man. Nico picked up the teapot and poured herself some more of the tea as she commanded. Do keep an eye on her and see what else this Hora learns. If she becomes a problem, I might need to eliminate this problem as I have eliminated past problems. The soul of tea. I had to abandon you. I have to leave you behind. I will one day have you again. Emerald Dragon Empress Tea. Chapter 34. Night Falls. The Main Hall. The aroma of the Emerald Dragon Empress Tea lingered within Horosha's nostrils. Its hints of guava and marigold mixed with the distinct scents of green and black tea delighted her senses. She must have this tea once again. She would have this tea once again. Now what? 
Rico questioned after they left the sitting room. Shortly we will go eat and rest. Sleep is also on the agenda but not until after my bath. Tomorrow after breakfast, we will interview the sons. Horo Shaw replied as the deputy and the steward left the sitting room. But first, I will speak to the steward before we retire for the night. She turned and followed the steward out of the manor. Just outside the manor, night had set in, and the male servants were about their duties of lighting and setting out the paper lanterns across the estate. Rico ran over and requested one of the lanterns that was on a long pole, and he brought it back to light their way. The four of them walked through the peacock garden and then through the south courtyard as the steward escorted the deputy to the front gate. A man, Horo Shah had never seen before, was by the front gate along with one of the guards. The deputy left as the guard told the steward, This is Akino and here are his papers. He has come to fill the position of the groom. The steward took the papers, stood under one of the lanterns, and said, I thought you would have been here before sunset. The new groom smiled and answered, It took longer to walk here than I anticipated. Follow me, Akino, the steward spoke, and I will show you to the stable. The steward noticed the ranin and the boy and asked Horo Shah, Was there something you needed? Yes, I need to speak to you again about the missing painting and kipa. We can speak once I show Akino where he will be staying in the stable. The steward quickly walked Akino to the stable and showed him a room in the back where he would sleep to keep watch over the horses. Horo Shah and the boy followed them. The steward finished, and the groom turned and petted a white-maned horse in one of the stalls. The steward headed for the manor, and the ranin walked after him as she started her questions. As head guard, Kipa kept track of who came and went. As the steward, did you also have access to these records? I did, the steward replied. In the past week, had anyone come onto the estate or left like one of the servants? Horo Shah questioned. Only the old groom had left. It was odd though. What was? The old groom was taking the day off and by the end of that day, I received a letter stating that he had to return home for his mother was gravely ill. The steward replied. The letter also stated that he most likely would not be returning as he had to take care of her. Why did you find it odd? The old groom was so reliable and I expected he would have told me in person that he was leaving. And I also thought he had told me long ago that he was an orphan. Hum. Yes, most odd, Horo Shah agreed. Thank you again for speaking to us. They arrived at the front door to the manor, and the steward went in. She and the boy remained outside. Horo Shah glanced up at the dark sky. The rest of the investigation would have to wait. It was time to eat and sleep. Tea haiku. Freshly brewed. Dark. Sweet. Tea of evening refresh me. Night guest indulge me. Chapter 35. Sweet comfort. Just outside the manor's front door. The day was completely gone, and the active apt mind needed its rest and relaxation. Her stomach also had some requirements to satisfy it. She would put the two cases on hold and start anew in the morning. Horo Shah turned to Rico as a new focus came into being, and she asked, Well, well, what, where are we staying? Is it nice? You will be very pleased, the boy told her. Are we heading there now? Lead on, she told him. We will be staying at the Red Lotus residence, Rico told her. It has a private path, and as you ordered, it has a hot spring. She let out a delighted squeal like a little girl, and then she said, Let's hurry. Rico led with his pole lantern. The boy took her back through the peacock garden and into the south courtyard. Beside the stable was a private gate that opened onto a path that ran along the south wall. The private path ran all the way to the southeast corner of the estate and then turned and went along the east wall. From the time they entered the gate near the stable, they were surrounded by a stone wall on one side and tall bamboo on the other. The lantern the boy held lit up their path but cast everything else beyond a six-foot circumference into their shadow counterpart. Horo Shah could hear the bamboo swaying in the gentle breeze and make out their silhouettes dancing in sync. Rico had been in the lead, but he slowed his pace until he was slightly behind her. He also kept glancing back. He started in a whisper, Horo, I feel like... I know, she whispered back. We are being followed. I believe by Samba. If the mistress of the manor is having her follow us, you must have hit on something with either the coins or the earring. I believe you are right but do not worry about her. She is only watching us. Horo Shah looked ahead to their residence and said, We have the first fruits of our fledgling case to enjoy. So let us go enjoy them. Life lessons from tea. Tea with lavender is like indulging thoughts of serenity. One must enjoy each sip as one enjoys tiny remarkable moments in life. Chapter 36. Enjoying the first fruits. Dishes. Yakitori. Yakitori was a type of skewered chicken. It was prepared, skewering the meat with kashi, a type of skewer made of bamboo. The chicken was grilled over a charcoal fire. During or after cooking, the meat was seasoned with tear sauce. Tear sauce varied from cook to cook but was mostly made out of soy sauce, ginger, vinegar, brown sugar, scallion, garlic, rice wine, and chicken broth. 
Dishes, Dakin salad also known as white radish salad. The basic Dakin salad was made from Dakin and sesame seeds. Other things like nori seaweed, cucumber, and tomatoes could be added. A dressing made from soy sauce, rice vinegar, sesame oil, and sugar was mixed in. Dishes, Takwan. Takwan was pickled Dakin radishes and was enjoyed at the end of meals as it was believed to aid digestion. The private path. The natural music of the day dwindled to silence as the harmony of the night began its part of life's chorus and slowly increased until it dominated the sounds. Horo Shah and Rico continued to their destination. The path ended near the middle of the east wall and at the Red Lotus residence. A new path led them to their own private hot spring. Horo Shah wanted to strip right there and go in, but she restrained herself and went into the residence through the back entrance. A meal had been set up for them. Komi prepared the yakitori, which was cooked with mushrooms, Dakin salad, takwan, and green tea flavored with lavender. They ate and enjoyed one another's company as they talked about what they had seen and experienced outside of investigating the case. After their meal, Horosha had the boy go outside and take his bath first while she thought about the case so far and enjoyed another nice cup of tea with lavender. She also knew she would be taking a very long bath. Rico came back inside, wearing a night robe the housekeeper had furnished for him. Why don't you go ahead and go to bed while I get my bath, she urged him. You must be exhausted. Don't you think one of us should stand guard? He asked, looking a little frightened. Someone did murder the head guard. Maybe they want to murder more people. I do not think the murder or the victim was random. Someone intended to kill Kipa. I just can't figure out the connection between his death and the stolen painting. She replied, noticed how worried the boy looked, and then said, I will take first watch, sleep while I have my bath. I see that the cook also left some black tea. I will brew some and stay up through most of the night. I will wake you toward the morning and then you can stand watch. He nodded and did as she requested. Horo Shah had her bath and then boiled some water and had a few cups of tea. She let Rico sleep from 9 p.m. until 4 a.m. Then she woke the boy and slept until 10 a.m. Bedtime Haiku. Greetings soft darkness. My head heavy and weary. Sweet long dreams take me. The soul of tea. I open my eyes and try to focus on a new day. It does my soul good to have a hot cup of tea to greet the sun. Chapter 37. The older and the younger. The Red Lotus Residence. It had been a long time since she slept so late in the day. When Horosha woke, breakfast had already been delivered and Rico had a cup of black tea ready for her to drink. She had a second cup of black tea and finished her breakfast. And then the two of them dressed and headed for the manor. Rico whispered as they walked the private path, Did Samba spy on us all night? I don't think so, but I do believe she has taken on her duty once again. Horosha and Rico went back along the path that exited through a gate at the stable. They walked through the south courtyard, then into the peacock garden and started toward the manor. Rico said, I feel as though we lost our shadow. I believe you are correct, and we lost her back near the stable. Horosha spoke. Heated words could be heard in the direction they had come from. We should return to the stable, Horosha said. I have a feeling someone or something has kept Samba from her mission. They returned to the south courtyard and spotted Samba yelling at the groom. She was very upset with him. Horosha and Rico couldn't make out what they were saying. Did not the guard, manning the south gate, say that the groom just arrived last night? Horosha questioned. And did not the steward show the groom to the stable as if he had never been there? Rico replied, they did. Samba seems to know the groom, and she is very angry at him over something. I believe she knows him. The house physician turned in their direction and stopped her argument with the groom when she spotted the ranan and the boy. Samba whispered something to the man and then went and walked past the ranan and the boy, and she said nothing to them. She did seem very upset. The groom went back into the stable. What do you think that was all about? Rico asked. I don't know, but let us continue to our next interview. Inside the manor, Rico and Horosha arrived at the steward's office and once they were bided to enter, she asked the steward, could you make arrangements for me to interview both of the sons? Both sons are in the shoin, the steward stated. The eldest invited the youngest to a luncheon since they are restricted from leaving the estate. Please announce us, Horosha requested. Some time later, the steward escorted them around the corner and through the main hall to the shoin. He announced the ranan and the boy and then left them in the shoin. The eldest son, Sora, was drunk and dancing about the room as Itsuki. The younger son, watched with contempt. A housemaid would come in every once in a while and deliver a new dish, an or bottle of sake. Sora danced for a few moments more as if he had not heard the steward announce their arrival. He went over to pour himself some more sake and finally noticed them. You are the ranan from before, Sora spoke as he stopped dancing and sat at the floor tray. I am? Are you wondering if we stole the staring feline painting? He asked. It is one of the questions that I came to ask, Horosha replied. 
I didn't steal that painting, Sora slurred out. She turned to the younger brother, waiting for him to answer the same question. I have stolen no paintings, Itsuki replied. I have no reason to. What is your reason? Horosha asked him. Itsuki spoke. I do not understand your question. What is your purpose on this estate? She restated. You are the second son. You will not inherit the estate. You also do not seem to paint. Why has Eshi never attempted to teach either of you the Anamaru style of watercolor? Our father seems to think there is truth in the Gaka family curse so he has never tried. Itsuki replied. I begged him when I was much younger to teach us, but my pleas landed on indifferent ears. I guess my father thought he would not be able to handle it if he was not able to pass on the style to us. Instead, he urges us to marry so that he can teach the next generation. Neither of you paint? She questioned and then when they didn't answer her, Horosha inquired. What do the two sons of a painter do if they do not paint? One whores around, Itsuki replied. And the other plans? What is this other plan? She inquired. Riko asked, does he plan on becoming the master of the estate himself? Itsuki glanced at the boy and then told the Ronin, I plan on proving my worth. Did proving your worth have anything to do with why you were spotted by the paper mill yesterday? Itsuki questioned, who said they saw me there? The kitchen girl, Horosha replied. What time were you there yesterday? He thought about not answering the Ronin, but then Itsuki replied, I went there around 4.30 p.m. I was there until I heard the bell sound the alarm. Horosha studied the youngest son, and then she said, I heard that you were smart, especially smart with numbers. Who said such a thing? He inquired, surprised anyone had taken notice. Your mother. Nico is not my mother, he insisted. By birth, no, she is not your mother, but I do get a sense that she cares for both of you. If this is true, and I doubt it, why has she not shown any love toward us? Itsuki inquired. If I were to guess, the reason is your father. He does not seem like the one to coddle young children and when Nico became his second wife, maybe he didn't want her coddling you two either. Maybe deep down he couldn't see anyone being your mother than the woman who gave birth to you two. Our father is very strict, Itsuki stated. Maybe what you have said is the truth. If everything I have said is true, tell me, one who wants to prove himself, what you were doing in the paper mill. Itsuki glanced at his older brother, and then he said, I think it would be better that I show you. Follow me, he said as he stood, and then he told his older brother, Sora, I will be back shortly, continue the party without me. A teapot is like, a cast iron teapot is like a dragon. It can heat up and spout brew that is hot as a flame. Dragons protect their gold, and teapots protect the dark liquid treasure within their rounded belly. Paper, washi. Washi was a type of paper made from local fiber, processed by hand, and made in long-held traditional methods. Washi was made using fibers from the inner bark of the gampi tree, the mitsumata shrub, or the paper mulberry bush. Washi was tougher than ordinary paper made from wood pulp and was used in traditional arts like origami. Paper, onion skin. Onion skin was a thin, lightweight, strong, translucent paper. It was not made from onions, but it resembled the thin papery skins of an onion. Onion skin paper was durable and lightweight due to the high content of cotton fibers. Paper, Anamaru style onion skin paper. The Gaka family created a special onion skin paper for their paintings. It held watercolor paint without bleeding and held the vibrant colors used in the Anamaru style with little fade. Chapter 38. Paper Dragons. The Shoin. Paper fluttering about. Paper fluttering about like origami dragons. That was what Horosha saw in her mind as she followed the youngest son out of the large room. Itsuki had been doing something on his own, something no one else knew about. He wanted to prove his worth, so what had he been up to? Riko and Horosha followed Itsuki to the main hall. He told them to go grab their shoes from the Jenkin. After they returned from the entranceway, he led the two of them to the back of the manor. They went outside and traveled through the estate until they reached the paper mill. It was close to the northwest corner. The three of them entered the paper mill, and Itsuki showed them around. My family is known for our paintings and the sale of the paintings has maintained this estate, but I believe we could do so much more. I have a few ideas to expand what we do here. We employ several local people and a few special artisans, but only in the spring through early summer. We create paper needed for this estate, but the paper we make is unique from the smudge-resistant letter paper we manufacture to the highly specialized onion skin paper for the Anamaru style of watercolor. We could employ people year-round and sell off what the household does not use. We could even start making washi. I was also thinking that my father could start a small school and teach the Anamaru style of watercolor. Why should it remain in our family? Why not teach a select few and expand our family's influence on the art world? I thought I might bring this idea to my father, and maybe he would allow me to manage the paper mill. And if he also likes the idea of the school, 
Maybe I can also manage it, and Sora could also be one of the instructors. It would not cost us much to start the school, and it would cost us nothing to expand production of our paper line. You have a very good idea, she told him. When do you plan on asking your father? I don't know, he admitted. I am almost afraid to ask. What if he says no? What purpose would I have besides siring the next generation of potential painters? The only thing I can say to that is, either live in fear of rejection and never ask or ask, Horosha replied. As she might just accept your offer to start a paper business. He might also reject it but then you can move on. Standing in fear is a harsh way to go through life. I should know. I see now what others see in you who have sung your praises. Ron and Detective, Itsuki said. You see things that most don't. I try, but something still eludes me, she admitted. Riko leaned to her and told her. You can be so wise, Horo. She thought of the crying samurai and Keikenna, the disgraced priestess who had been her nanny. And then she stated, no, I just had very good teachers. She looked all around the paper mill, and then she told the youngest son, why don't we go see if the cook will whip us up some tea? Once we have gathered liquid reinforcements, we can go back to the shoin, and I can continue my questioning. Tea haiku. Eye-opening brew. Strike. Kill the drunk within him. Sobering black tea. Chapter 39. The paintings in the painting room. Some time later, the boy, the ranin, and the youngest son arrived back in the shoin and found Sora asleep. Itsuki went over and woke his older brother. Here, drink this. Itsuki told him as he handed him an extra tea that he had brought. Sora took the cup and sipped on the dark brew and made a face as he asked. What is this? It is not your usual drink but drink up. Father wants you to answer the ranin's questions. Father wants me to. Sora eagerly took the tea and said, Then I will. He sipped on the tea as he continued to make faces as if he was battling a foul beast. Itsuki, the ranin, and the boy all sat on the floor cross-legged. Sora, Horosha began after giving the oldest a few moments more to get some tea in him. Tell me about the painting. There are hundreds of paintings on our estate, he began. How can anyone keep track of them? Any painting my father finds valuable to him is in the vault. The rest of the paintings are just... He turned to his younger brother and asked, What is the word I am looking for? Trivial like we are to him, Itsuki replied. Horosha said, I believe we have gotten off track. I am talking about a particular painting, the painting that was stolen. Sora was all glassy-eyed as he said, the stolen paintings. Horosha started to answer, but then remembered her trip through the painting room, and stated instead, I did notice as I was admiring your family's collection of paintings that there were spots here and there where the paintings seem fresh like they were just painted this year and not decades ago. Do you know anything about the paintings I am talking about? No. Sora shouted, spilling some tea. I never painted any paintings and replaced the originals with my own, and I never sold the originals. I would never do a thing like that. She turned to his younger brother and inquired, did you know he was doing this? No, I don't think anyone did. Nico might have known, Horosha stated. She mentioned that Sora had a hidden talent that he used only when he saw it would gain him wealth. I wonder if she knew Sora was painting replicas of his family's original paintings and then selling off the originals. Did Eshi know? If Eshi knew, why did he not think Sora stole the staring feline? That is father's favorite. The eldest son slurred out. He loves it more than anything. He loves it more than us. She asked, did you help keep us steal the painting or were you going to help keep us sell the staring feline? No, not me. Sora spoke. And then he began to weep as he asked, how could I ever compare to that stupid cat? Itsuki went over and put his arm around his brother, and Sora continued to cry. Itsuki asked, Do you think my brother was working with Kipa? No, I still believe Kipa was working alone, Horosha replied. In your brother's mind, the painting represents the love his father is capable of but never gives to him, to any of you. In a way, he idolizes the painting and could never do anything to it, including having someone steal it. She added, In my mind, I have cleared you two of stealing the painting. What about Kipa's murder? Itsuki inquired. I am almost certain neither of you had anything to do with his death, Horosha replied. She paused and considered all the information she had gathered so far, and then she asked, Sora, the steward thinks that you are a ghost. Are you talking about how I sneak in the ladies from town? I am, she replied. How do you do it? Is there a secret entrance onto the estate? Onto the estate? No, but I do use a secret way known as a courtesan wall. It allows me to enter from the back and not use any of the doorways. I see. I had hoped the secret way had allowed a murderer to come and go onto the estate without being seen. I am back to the murderer as someone within the household. She sighed as she stated, I thought one or both of you would make good suspects but now. I am left with seeking another. Horosha stood and headed for the exit as she spoke. The tea I selected this time has no taste. 
I need a little tea with spice. Life lessons from tea. Truth is always best as freshly brewed tea is always best. Chapter 40. The Mistress of the Manor. The Main Hall. Horoshaw came across one of the housemaids and inquired of her the whereabouts of the mistress. The housemaid said that she believed she was back at the house physician's residence. Horoshaw and Rico headed there next. The boy said, Horo, you seem bothered. I am, she admitted. Something has been bothering me about the interviews we have conducted so far. Oh, and here is someone I was wanting to talk to again. The housekeeper passed them. Imari, a few quick questions. Horosha called out to her and waited for her to turn and face her. Horosha spoke. You said that Nico wanted to meet you in the orchard yesterday. How do you know this? The mistress left me a note on my desk. The housekeeper replied. Is it a common practice of hers to write you notes? It is, the housekeeper answered. Do you still have the note? I should in my office, the housekeeper replied. Please go find it and keep it on your person. Horosha spoke. I would like to look at it the next time we meet. The housekeeper nodded and continued on her way. The Red Clover residence. The Ronin and the boy arrived at the front entrance to the residence. She remembered her manners and since there was no one there other than Nico and Samba, she sent Rico in to request that they continue their meeting. Nico granted her request, and Horosha entered the residence. Before you question me, I have a question for you, Ronin. Go on, Horosha said. Nico questioned her. Do you purposely hide that you are a woman or do you just not correct people who believe you are a man? I find it easier for others to believe a detective is a man until they are ready to accept that I am a woman. Do people always accept you? No, Horosha answered. And then she asked, which type of person are you? I am the kind of person who will judge you by your results as to whether or not you are a good detective. Nico replied. As for lying to me by omission, I can forgive at this instance. She turned and motioned to the table both she and Samba were sitting at. And then Nico said, you made me a promise the last time we met. Will you keep it? Horosha wasn't sure what she meant until the mistress glanced at the boy, and then Horosha said, Rico, go to the cook and let her know we are ready for lunch. You pick this time what we will have if the cook gives you the option. I will meet you at our residence when I am done here. The boy nodded and left. I thought you had forgotten, Nico stated. I had until you reminded me, Horosha admitted. Tell me, Ronan, what is your real name? Surely it is not Horosha for Wanderer. Rico also likes to call me, Horo. I do not believe your mother called you Abacus. What is your real name? My mother named me, Yoke, she replied. Nico said, it means, breaking dawn. Horosha nodded, and then she thought about it and added, I think my mother named me, Yoke. She died giving birth to me. Maybe my father named me, Yoke. No, it was your mother, Nico spoke with certainty. Her gaze became distant as if she was thinking of something dear that happened to her in the past. And then she said, she would have seen you in her arms and named you on the spot. Horosha felt her face flush, embarrassed to have someone say such a nice thing about her. She was embarrassed, but she was also happy to hear the compliment. She believed now more than ever that her mother loved her very deeply even though they spent little time together. I always wanted a baby girl of my own. Nico spoke as she withdrew into her thoughts. I would have named her AI. It means love, Horosha stated, feeling the warmth and care the older woman had for a child she never had. Nico nodded and then got all teary-eyed as she said, I was unable to get pregnant and provide Eshi with another child. Samba reached out and grabbed her friend's hand and squeezed it, knowing the sorrow her friend endured. Nico wiped away a tear as she requested, Can I call you, Yoke, when it is just the three of us? I would like that, Horosha said. I would like that very much. Chapter 41, Winter Tea. The Red Clover Residence. Nico motioned to the table both she and Samba were sitting at, and the Ronin joined them. Horosha noticed that Nico had been enjoying strawberries again for the stems were on a plate. A housemaid came in and cleared the table of the plates, cups, and teapot. The housemaid noticed the Ronin sitting there and when she returned a short time later, she set out three teacups along with a fresh pot of already brewed tea. You had some more questions for me. Nico inquired once the housemaid finished with her duties and it was just the three of them again. I did, Horosha spoke. You said that the housekeeper wanted to meet you in the orchard yesterday. How do you know this? One of the housemaids delivered a note from the housekeeper while I was in the koi garden. Nico replied. Do you still have the letter? I do not. I left it in the garden. Horosha turned to the house physician and asked, Samba, would you mind going to the garden and looking for the note? When did I become your servant? She questioned. Samba, please. Nico spoke. Fine, but my price is that I can also call the Ronin. Yoke, I don't want to feel left out. Horosha nodded as she coyly smiled. The house physician stood and left the table. Nico asked, Would you like some tea, Yoke? Horosha felt herself blush again, and then she asked even though her nose had already told her the answer, 
Is it Emerald Dragon Empress Tea? It is not, Nico replied with a smirk. Does this mean you do not want any? No, Horosha replied as she picked up the cup that was in front of her and handed it to the mistress. I never pass on tea. Nico took the cup, set it down, and poured some of the hot liquid into it. She handed it to the Ronin. Horosha took it, breathed in the black tea's citrus aroma, and then sipped on the dark brew. What do you think? Nico inquired. It is my own blend. Horosha breathed in its scent again filled with hints of orange, cinnamon, anise, and clove. She took another sip and then replied, It is very good almost as good as the Emerald Dragon Empress tea. Thank you, it is a very high compliment you have given me, Nico said. I created the blend for winter, but I was craving the flavors so I had it made. Life lessons from tea. Tea enjoyed with friends is the best tea of all. The soul of tea. I indulged myself, partaking of a winter blend of tea. The smell and taste of the brew drew me into the snowy landscape and crisp refreshing air. A seasonal time of family. Chapter 42. Written words. The Red Clover Residence. The two of them enjoyed the spicy tea, finding a budding friendship, a mother-daughter facsimile in the making. The silence was quiet but it was also filled with sentiment. Nico waited a few moments, and then she asked, Is there anything you would like to ask me while Samba is gone? Yes, I have two questions. The first one is, why did you have your friend follow us? Do you mean, Samba? I do. I have observed that she watches over you like an older sister. I also see the care you have for her. What other term than friend is there to describe your relationship? Horosha asked, waited on a reply and when none came, she added, friends are hard to come by. Cherish them while you can. I had her follow you for I do not trust you. Do not get me wrong, Yoke, I like you. I see a child I could have had in you, but I do not trust you when it comes to my family. You are hunting for the truth, and I fear when you find some of those truths, you will hurt my family. Do you speak of your older son creating replicas of your ancestors' paintings, replacing them with his own, and then selling off the originals? Nico stared at the young woman, amazed by what she had uncovered already. She asked, what will you do with this truth? Do with what truth? Horosha questioned. I have not uncovered anything to report to Eshi concerning the missing painting he hired me to find. She took another sip of her citrus tea and said, I am curious though, why do you allow Sora to continue? First, Nico thought about Yoke holding on to the secret of Sora's wrongdoing. A crime had been committed against the one who hired her. Why would Yoke not tell Eshi? Nico considered the character of this young woman. She had just met her yesterday so to gauge one after only a few hours of interaction might not completely show one's character. She did know that Yoke would seek the truth concerning the staring feline and keep his murder. At first, I was hoping my husband would find out on his own and then finally discipline Sora. Nico answered. Now, what does it matter what Sora does? He needs a hand to guide him. As she abandoned that responsibility long ago. I am not even sure if he ever took responsibility for his son's growth. Maybe you should step up and take on the duty, Horosha suggested. How can I? Sora and Itsuki are both men. They would never listen to me and besides, as she would never allow me to guide them. Maybe you should just do it without your husband's permission. Horosha told her. It seems to me he has locked himself in his studio and away from life. He might be so absent from his life that he will not notice. Nico thought about what Yoke had said, and then she stated, You had a second question for me. Yes, Horosha replied. I saw Samba arguing with the new groom today. Do you know what the argument was over? I do not, Nico replied and then added, she never mentioned arguing with him. What would they have to argue about? He just arrived yesterday evening. I wondered the same thing, Horosha said and then took another sip of her tea. She smiled as the tea was very good. The house physician returned empty-handed and said, I looked everywhere in the garden, but I didn't see a note. Horosha questioned, are you sure the letter was in the housekeeper's handwriting? I couldn't tell you, Nico replied. I didn't pay much attention to the writing only what it relayed. Horosha stood and said, Thank you for the tea. I will be going now. Why are you in such a hurry? Nico questioned. Did you discover something? No. Not really. I just realized how hungry I was. I need to go eat. Please excuse me. The Ronin left, and Samba came and sat at the table. She poured herself some tea and began to sip on it. Nico thought about what had been said, then turned to the house physician, and stated, Yoke tells me that you were arguing with the groom. Was I? Samba spoke, turning her gaze from the mistress. I don't remember. How can you not remember? And how do you know the groom? He just arrived last night. I don't know the groom, Samba said as she stood and headed for the exit. I just realized I am also hungry. I am going to see what the cook has. She rushed out as she asked, Do you want anything? I want you not to lie to me, Nico answered her friend as she fled from her. I want you to stop hiding things from me. Tea haiku. Tea leaves sprout harsh truth. Disillusion wind sweeps them. 
Truth Hidden by Fear. Chapter 43, Whisper in the Koi Garden. Outside Red Clover Residence, Samba headed for the tiny kitchen to find herself a bite to eat and to escape Nico's interrogation. She could never lie to the mistress, so it was best that she avoided the questions she didn't want to speak untruths about. Samba had left her residence and walked some distance toward the manor when she heard a noise coming from the koi garden. She paused but didn't hear anything, so she continued toward the manor when she heard the noise again. Samba walked back and then went into the walled koi garden through its gate. She didn't see anyone there, so she started to leave when she heard someone whisper. Can you see it? Who is there? Samba asked. Can you see it? The person whispered again. Samba walked deeper into the garden and spotted something floating in one of the ponds. It looked like a stick with a red ribbon tied around it. The house physician walked over to the edge of the pond and recognized the knife completely made out of bamboo. She put a hand over her mouth to stifle a gasp. Samba looked all around again and saw no one in the garden, so she knelt and reached her hand out to grab the floating bamboo knife. But it was just out of reach. Samba scooted closer to the edge, mudding her kimono around her knees as she stretched further. Her fingertip touched the edge of the knife, and she pulled it closer until she was able to grab it. A blur of material fluttered in front of her face, and then the material wrapped around her head as someone pushed her face first into the pond. Samba struggled to free herself of the material as she started to drown. She fought for her life as she knew she only had seconds more to free herself of her watery grave. She tried desperately to pull the material off of her face as she held her breath. Samba remembered the bamboo knife she held and cut across the person's forearm, but the blade made of wood didn't penetrate their clothing. She fought and fought as the seconds ticked by and then the inevitable happened. Samba inhaled water. Life lessons from tea. Drink tea and be merry when life gives you opportunities. Chapter 44. Another victim. The Red Lotus Residence. There was a lightness in the air or maybe a lightness to her steps as Horosha entered her residence and found Rico there setting up their lunch. Usually, she would marvel over the different types of dishes, but she was distracted by many things and a sense of happiness. Nico might not have known what she had done for her, but Horosha felt a deeper connection to her mother than she had ever had before. Her mother, Suisen, had named her, and she was her mother's breaking dawn. Horosha felt the love of the woman she had never known and this love was very precious to her. I'm so hungry, Horosha said ready to dig into the food. I could eat a tiger. Not if the tiger eats you first, the boy told her. They began their meal, and Rico observed her. He noticed how she seemed much happier than the last time he saw her. You like Nico, don't you? He questioned. I do, she reminds me of. Of my sister but just older. So you are saying you see your mom in her? My mother, maybe. Or at least the person I thought my mother would be like. I never knew Suisen. They enjoyed a few more minutes of eating and then someone shouted her name. Horosha, Horosha. Gato yelled as he burst into their residence and shouted. Quickly, come with me. Someone has murdered the house physician. She raced after the new head guard as he ran to the koi garden. What happened? She inquired. I heard a commotion like violent splashing and went into the garden. I saw someone flee over the wall but did not see who. I saw Samba face down in a pond with some material wrapped around her face. Someone drowned her. I dragged her out and removed the material, but she was very still. The Koi Garden. Horosha ran faster than Gato and Rico, and she entered the garden before they did. She entered just as Nico came running in. Horosha noticed that Nico's kimono was covered in mud around her knees. Nico ran over to her friend, knelt, and lifted her into her arms. She embraced her and wept over her. Samba. No. Not you. Don't go. Samba. Samba. She rocked her friend back and forth. Horosha felt powerless to do anything but comfort the mistress. She put out her hand to touch her shoulder and noticed a white hair. Horosha paused, and then Samba spat up water and started to cough. Turn her on her side, Horosha told Nico. Nico laid her down on her side and said, Samba. Samba, the house physician spat some more water and then opened her eyes and coughed some more. Her eyes then rolled back in her head, and she was out. Gatto knelt down and then said, she is breathing, but I think she fainted. Carry her to her residence, Horosha ordered him. Gatto lifted her into his arms and hurried off, and Nico followed by his side. Horosha started to follow after them when she spotted the floating bamboo knife with a red ribbon tied around it. It was at the edge of the pond so she easily fished it out. What is that? Rico asked. I'm not sure, she replied. A knife of some sort, I believe, but it is made out of bamboo. What would such an instrument be used for? Horosha thought about it but realized she couldn't focus on the mystery when someone was so close to death. We need to hurry. Rico, go find the steward or the housekeeper and see if anyone else has medical training who is on the estate. Tell them what happened to the house physician. The boy quickly ran out. 
Horoshaw grabbed the wet material that had been around Samba's head and raced to the house physician's residence that was next door. The soul of tea. I yearn for tea but my soul aches for my friend to wake up. Chapter 45. Samba. The Red Clover Residence. Minutes ago, a happiness Horoshaw couldn't put into words encompassed her. She found a deeper connection to her mother, but the happiness she experienced had been taken away. Someone tried to murder the house physician. A second death had nearly occurred under her usually observant gaze. What was really happening in the Gaka estate? And what did these murders have to do with the missing staring feline? How is she? Horoshaw asked as she entered and found Nico holding Samba's hand as the house physician laid on her bed. She hasn't moved since she coughed up the water outside. Gatto answered since the mistress was unable to through her sobs. Gatto, tell me again what happened. Think about what drew you to the Koi Garden. Horoshaw spoke. Violent splashing and... I called out to see if anyone was in the area. I heard what sounded like running as I headed for the gate of the Koi Garden. I heard someone climbing a wall in the distance and by the time I entered the garden, he or she was gone. I believe you saved the house physician by calling out, Horoshaw told him. The killer was interrupted and had to flee the scene so that they wouldn't be caught. Samba owes you her life. If she wakes again, Nico sobbed, and then she whispered to her friend, you have to wake. You are the only one who has made my life bearable. Horoshaw once again noticed the white hair on Nico's shoulder, and she removed it without the older woman noticing. Horoshaw examined the hair that most likely came from the white-maned horse she saw earlier in the stable and felt something sticky on it. She smelled the substance and discovered it was pine sap. Horoshaw thought it was odd to find pine sap since she hadn't seen any pine trees on the estate. She removed her snail knife and cut a small piece of the seam off her black hakama, traditional Japanese trousers, and placed the hair in the black material. Horoshaw then placed the black material in the silk handkerchief. She didn't want to ask any more questions of the woman who was so worried about her friend, but it needed to be asked. Nico, have you been to the stable today? No, why would I? She replied in a sob and then said, Samba, don't leave me. Minutes later, Rico entered with the steward and one of the male servants. The male servant rushed over to Samba and started to check over her. The steward introduced the man. This is Asakwe. He used to be a pig farmer and saw to all their needs. He knows a little about medicine. You brought Samba a man who has only worked on pigs? Nico cried out. Just for now, the steward said. I sent one of the servants by horse into town to bring back the doctor. It will take him at least an hour to return. Asakwe looked over the house physician, and then he said, I believe she has entered Kansui. The deep sleep. Kansui is serious, Horoshaw stated. She may wake in hours or days or, why won't she wake? Nico questioned. She opened her eyes after she spat up the water. Asakwe answered, I do not know. Horoshaw pulled Gato aside and told him, I want you to guard Samba. Don't leave her side. I fear she is still in danger especially if she wakes. Where are you going? Gato inquired. I am going to question the groom. He and Samba had a very heated discussion this morning. Horoshaw answered. But first, she took the wet material she had in her hand and examined it. And then Horoshaw spoke. I believe this is a blanket. She hung it over a nearby chair to dry and said, Gato, make sure no one takes this. Rico, here, put this in your satchel, Horoshaw said as she handed the boy the bamboo knife. He took it and started to place the knife in the satchel. And then he said, Horo, the red ribbon matches the ribbon that was found next to Kipa. Why do you think it is around this wooden knife? I am not sure. Maybe it was tied around the knife so that Samba could see it in the pond. Horoshaw speculated. If it did not have the ribbon, she might have mistaken it for a stick and not gone after it. Rico questioned, do you believe the house physician was trying to retrieve the knife from the pond? I do. I believe someone set a trap so that they might sneak up behind Samba and drown her. Drown her as if there was meaning behind the drowning as there is meaning with the knife. Horoshaw started for the door and said, come, we hurry for the stable. Tea haiku. A horse dark as tea. I would like to ride on you. A horse just for me. Chapter 46. The would-be murderer. Some time later. The stable. Rico and Horoshaw ran all the way to the stable and noticed the guard that was supposed to be on duty at the south gate was not there. She paused at the entrance to the stable and looked in. Horoshaw heard the horses within but no one moving about. Akino, are you here? Horoshaw called out to the groom. Akino? She paused to see if he would answer and when he didn't, she entered the first section and said, Rico, see if any of the horses are out of their stalls. He raced through the first section that housed the horses, checking the stalls with hay in them and then reported. Only the one the servant used to go retrieve the town doctor. She headed to the second section of the stable where the tackle and saddles were stored. Horoshaw upped and stopped when she entered the next area, and then she turned and left. 
Rico, I need for you to immediately go to the barracks and bring back three guards. Tell them the Ronan detective has need of them. What is it? He questioned. Did you find the groom? I did, she replied. Aquino is dead. Rico started to go into the next room, and she told him, Do not go in. You do not want to see. You will not be able to unsee. Please go to the barracks. He wanted to go in and look, but he obeyed her, turned, and ran off. Horosha waited until she heard him running in the distance, and then she went back into the tack room. The groom was lying on his back with his arms spread out in a cross. Ropes were around his wrists, and the ropes had been tied to nearby posts. A wound was in his stomach, and a bloody spear laid beside him. He was also gagged. Horosha stared at him and since she was alone, she allowed herself to feel. Emotions of failure, shame, ineptness, and sadness. She allowed herself to feel these, and a tear ran down her face. She wiped it away before it had a chance to fall off of her cheek, and then she pushed those emotions down. Horosha tucked them away so that she could do her job. She walked around his body, making sure not to disturb it. Where he was pierced, it looked as though he bled slowly and died equally as slow as if death had been measured out to him. Would the killer have watched him die? Or would they have left and abandoned him to die alone, die knowing he couldn't save himself? She went over and removed the gag and found nothing in his mouth but did notice that he had a wound on the back of his head similar to keep his head wound. As with Samba, the killer was committing the murders in different ways and leaving behind different items. Different clues as to why they were doing what they were doing. Horosha still didn't understand why they would leave intentional clues. Did they want to be caught or were they leaving behind a message that was intended for her or someone else? Maybe the items had no meaning or maybe they were part of a larger picture. She still couldn't see the painting only the deliberate strokes of depth and shape. It was almost as if the painting was larger than she thought. The area she was meticulously looking at would never take shape as she was too close to see it. She needed to take a step back. Horosha walked around him again. Was the groom killed before the attempt on Samba's life or after or a little of both? Did the murderer run him through with the spear? Go attack the house physician and then return later. She walked around him once more and discovered something in his right hand. A coin was there, and ate copper. She picked it up and saw that the coin left behind a brand of itself in his palm. Someone had superheated the coin and branded the groom's palm with the eight copper symbol. It looked like the brand was placed there after he died. He never struggled as the mark was branded cleanly with no double marks. Maybe she was right. Maybe the killer tied him up, ran him through with the spear, and then returned some time later. Maybe after they tried to kill the house physician. Horosha removed the silk handkerchief from her kimono and added the coin to the other items. Eight copper. She spoke softly. Eight copper. What could it mean? Life lessons from tea. Tea is simple. Flavorful. And direct in its taste. Life can be complicated. Bland. And indecisive in its approach. Chapter 47. The Groom. The Tack Room. It seemed like hours had gone by, but it was only a few minutes as Horosha continued her inspections. She searched the groom's body one more time before Rico returned with three guards. The four of them all breathed heavily as they had been running. They were in the first section of the stable. Horosha came out of the tack room and told them, the body of the groom is in the next room. I need for two of you to take him in the ropes to the vault and set him beside Kipa in case I want to inspect his body later. She focused on the third guard and said, I need for you to find the guard who should have been on duty at the south gate. If you find him alive, bring him to me. I will be either at the house physician's residence or the Red Lotus residence. The guards went about their work. Horosha while deep in thought headed for the back of the estate. The boy followed after her. Eight copper, Horosha repeated. Eight copper, what are you saying? Rico questioned her. I found a coin in the groom's hand. It had actually been branded in his palm. It was an eight copper. Eight copper should mean something. It's right on the tip of my brain, but I can't snatch it. I saw something or heard something recently that should mean something but I either ignored it or never truly grasped its meaning. The boy kept in pace with her as he thought about what she meant by a deeper meaning. A coin was a coin. A coin was a piece of metal. It had value and could be traded for something. I know one thing the coin might mean, Rico spoke up. It is the standard rate for one night. Standard rate for one night of what? She asked. You know, the boy said, hoping she would catch on and he wouldn't have to explain it. Rico used his head and pointed behind them as if there was something there to see as he said, one night of, no, I don't know, Horosha said as she peered behind them as if there was something to see. You will have to explain what you mean. Rico thought about how to tell her without going into details. And then he said, do you remember the man who shouted at you in the town of Yukon as we were leaving? There were a few male peddlers shouting at me, Horosha stated. Rico said, this particular man shouted, Ronan, eight copper for her time, eight copper for her time, eight copper for her time, Horosha repeated. 
And then her light green eyes widened when she finally understood. Her time. The woman with the man in the alley was a prostitute. Rico nodded. So a copper for her time meant. Oh. Horosha looked at the coin in the handkerchief. If this coin represents a knight with a prostitute and it was branded in his palm, maybe the coin and the brand represent his passion, an unquenchable lust, or someone he wronged or... I don't know. Maybe I'm stretching its meaning. Maybe the coin has no symbolism. Horo Shaw sighed. She was exhausted mentally, physically, and emotionally, and she was nowhere near solving the mystery. Two people were dead and a third. Samba could still die. Horo Shaw walked faster as she wanted to check on the status of the house physician as she continued thinking. One murder could be connected to the theft, but someone tried to kill two more people who had no connection to the painting, and this person succeeded in killing the groom. Maybe that was it. Maybe the murders had nothing to do with the stolen staring feline. Maybe she had been wrong all of this time. Maybe she was not examining one puzzle but two. She would have to start over. No. She would have to take all the clues from the murders and start a different investigation. An investigation not into a thief but an investigation into a bloodthirsty killer. The soul of T. I looked into the depths of T and it peered back at me. What did it see? Chapter 48. Checking on the house physician. The Red Clover Residence. Samba was still in the grip of Kansui when Horosha and the boy returned. Nico had stopped crying, but she was still holding her friend's hand. Gatto stood guard over them. The steward had left to tell Eshi about the attempt on the house physician's life. Asakwi was still there, but all the once pig farmer was doing was taking Samba's pulse. Nico turned as the Ranan and the boy entered, and then she questioned, what did the groom have to say for himself? Horosha glanced at Gatto, and then she answered, the groom is dead, murdered. Horosha walked over to the wet blanket and examined it more closely without taking it off of the chair. And then she said, This looks like a baby blanket. She had asked for the bamboo knife from Rico on their walk back to the residence and looked over its edge as she questioned, And what sort of knife is this? The knife you have is a knife a midwife would use to cut the umbilical cord of a newborn. A man answered as he came and followed by a male servant. I am Jairo the town doctor. What can you tell me about my patient? Nico and Gatto started to explain the situation to the doctor, and their voices faded in the distance within Horosha's mind. A knife for an umbilical cord and a baby blanket, an earring that represented Boy's Day. Three silver coins paid to silence Keepa for something he knew and, or something he did. And the last clue, the eight copper, the painting, whose strokes had taken no form, was starting to take shape. Horosha turned and left, heading for Eshi's studio. She needed to talk to Eshi. She needed to talk to the man who had hidden himself away in his turtle tower. Life lessons from tea. Tea can be served hot or cold, but a temper always runs hot. Chapter 49. The Turtle Tower. The Yellow Lotus Studio. Confusion mixed with a dash of anger world within her mind. Horosha had never had a case where things eluded her so. Her emotions were more active than usual, but she didn't think that was the reason for her incertitude. Something else was at work here. Someone. Who? Oh was painting a picture. Rico and Horosha arrived at the center of the estate, and she didn't worry about protocol or respecting his position as master of the manor. Horosha barged in without anyone announcing herself and found Eshi talking with the steward on the seventh and highest level of the studio. The master of the manor turned and told the Ranan, it would seem I should have gone with the samurai detective. Two are dead and the house physician will most likely never wake up. I would not give up on Samba so easily, Horosha told him with vexation thick in her tone. Why have you come to see me? As she questioned, mirroring her outrage but for a different reason. The Ranan was taking an air of indignation against him, and he didn't like it especially coming from a young woman. As she questioned as if he had nothing to be wrong about, are you here to tell me that this case is too much for you? Are you here to tell me you will be abandoning it without retrieving my painting? Two people are dead, she told him with growing contempt, and someone who has taken care of your family was nearly killed. How can you talk about the painting? Someone is murdering the people around you. You are wasting my time and yours if that is all you came to tell me, as she spoke, waving the Ron in a way as if Horosha was one of his housemates. She said already knowing her failures, I am not giving up, and I am not here to tell you any excuses as to why I have not solved these cases yet. Cases. Yes, I believe the murders have nothing to do with the stolen painting, Horosha told him. Someone has come to your estate for a purpose I cannot grasp yet. I need to know if there is a reason that anyone would try to hurt you or your family. Does anyone have a grudge against you? A grudge? No. I also know of no one who would want to hurt me or my family. Tell me about your family, Horosha spoke. You asked me this before. Answer me with the knowledge you have gained since last we talked, Horosha told him. I do not understand your request. 
tell me who your sons are. What kind of men are they? And tell me the person your wife is, Horosha rephrased. My sons? Sora and Itsuki are. They are? I don't know what kind of men they are. A fault you need to own up to, Horosha told him. Tell me about Nico. Nico. She, what first attracted you to her? Horosha questioned, urging him to explore his past. Her smile, as she replied as a distant memory grabbed hold of him and kept him a willing prisoner of the bygone years. It did not matter how dark my mood was. Once I saw her smile, it was like sunshine had burned away the night. Tell me more. My first wife had passed, leaving me with Sora and Itsuki to raise on my own. I was lonely and my grief caused me to seek companionship, someone to comfort my sorrow. I thought I had found someone during my first days of mourning, a bird with beautiful plumage, but she was not the one. As she peered at the Ronin as he debated telling her a secret that could take down his entire family, he turned to the steward and said, You can leave us. I will continue my conversation with the Ronin alone. Love Haiku. My heart is aflame. My thoughts long for my dear love. My heart. Turtle Dove. The soul of tea. I thought I saw a man who only indulged in his art. A man consumed by his work as I am consumed by mysteries and tea. I saw another side to him. A side with a beating heart. Chapter 50. Crimson Lit Streets. The Yellow Lotus Studio. Horosha sensed the master of the manor wanted to divulge something to her. Something of a sensitive manner. So she had Rico leave with the steward. She ignored the protocol that dictated a woman should not be left alone with a man who was not her husband or family member. Time had become a nuisance. A nuisance that might grow into something far worse if she didn't quickly solve these cases. As she continued once it was just the two of them. But he was sidetracked by the empty paper on his desk and said, The painting will not speak to me. I have let too many things distract me. She glanced at the empty painting that was waiting on the first stroke to begin its journey to completion. And then she said, Your sons are not a distraction. Of what I hear, you hardly see them. I am not speaking of them, he replied. Are you speaking of your wife, Nico has become? As she began as his face bore the weariness his wife's accusations had placed upon him. Her words weigh heavily on my mind, he admitted with contempt. His expression became grim as he declared with no emotions. So much so? I had to do something to alleviate myself of her distraction. His words concerned Horosha, so she asked, What sort of words bothered you? The very thing that I wish not to do, as she replied. Nico wants me to turn my attention away from my work, my family's legacy, and devote my attention to my sons. She claims that they need my guidance. They are men, not boys. What sort of guidance do they need from me? Horosha sensed he wasn't asking her advice. The master of the manor did not want to change the course he was on. He wanted to remain in his turtle tower. She decided to move her investigation forward instead and asked, What did you do to alleviate yourself of her distraction? I did something no husband should ever do to his wife. I, as she spoke and then pulled from his thoughts a split second before his complete confession. A hint of guilt. That was all she saw. Only a hint. He did seem to feel guilty about something. But as she was more determined to move forward with whatever he had set in motion than any reversal of deeds, Horosha knew he would say no more on that matter. Not at this time. She would have to figure out a way to come back to his deed in this discussion at a later time. She remembered the reason as she sent the steward away. And she said, You were talking about the time after your first wife passed. I was, as she spoke, eager to leave the current conversation. He paused and then began. As I said, I was lonely and my grief caused me to seek companionship. And I sought this companionship in a faraway town. The crimson lit streets were all aglow as if cherries had set the night ablaze and that first evening was the night I saw her. I never looked at another once I found her. I immediately fell in love with her, and I found in Nico someone equally lonely, but she also had a... He smiled as he stated, warmth and cheerfulness about her that I wanted in my life. I made sure no other man could of her, but it wasn't enough. She was not free as I, but she was also not completely trapped. Money could solve all our problems. I eventually asked her to marry me and once I eliminated her debt and she took care of a family matter, we left her town. We married in a town I had never been in before, and then we came back here. Do any of your servants or your sons know of her origins? Horosha questioned. I don't think so. If her origin ever got out, her reputation would be ruined. The whole Gaka family's reputation would be ruined. And yet you still took her as your wife, Horosha mumbled, considering the character of Eshi. And then she stated, Reputation is very important to everyone including me. Do you know of anyone who might know? Samba knows. She came with her. The house physician's place of business was close to where Nico worked, and they had become good friends. What about Kipa? He would have also known though we never spoke about it. 
Keepa worked at Nico's place of business as a bouncer. Keepa saved my life one night as I was leaving and three men jumped me to steal my money. Keepa drove them away before they could kill me. I told him I owed him and later, he came to work for me as a guard and then later became the head guard. What about the groom? She asked. The groom? Are you talking about the new groom? The one who was murdered? As she questioned. And then he answered, I have not seen him. The steward was in charge of his hiring. He moved across the room, sat on a floor pillow, and then said, It has been so long since I thought about what Nico means to me. She had meant so much to me. And I let those sentiments drift away. I let them drift as if I self-weaned myself from the dependence I had for her love and at the same time, suppressed the love I had for her. What have I done? The things I have set in motion. Can I stop them? He noticed her peering at him curiously as if the Ranan was trying to snatch the answers from his face. As she turned from her as he also turned the conversation away from Nico and asked, what have I done to this family? My sons, I have also let them down. I had let them fade into the background as images of their sons. Sons they have not had yet came into the foreground. She waited to see if he would say any more and when he didn't, Horo Shah informed him, I will not stop until I have figured out who killed Kipa and the groom. But I can do nothing about the relationship that you once had with your family, a relationship that you murdered talk to your family. Tell them, tell them what? As she asked. I don't know, but you need to start talking to them before words and sentiment are too late. Master? The steward called out. What is it? As she inquired. Your uncle and his wife will be arriving soon along with the town magistrate and one of his deputies. Your uncle sent one of his guards by horse to inform us of their arrival. I will greet him at the south gate, as she spoke. I will tell my uncle what has happened, and he can decide whether or not to stay on this estate that has become a household of death. Tea haiku. Dark brown citrus scent. Floating yellow goodness wedge. Lemon in my tea. Chapter 51. Uncle Tadao and Lady Rai. The South Courtyard. Five more of his uncle's guards on horseback entered through the south gate as they escorted a carriage. The town magistrate and one of his deputies were also on horseback. The carriage stopped in Eshi's uncle, a man in his 70s who was going blind and his new wife disembarked. A lady's maid accompanied the new wife and had exited first. She shaded her mistress with an umbrella. His uncle had a cane, and Lady Rai wore a black veil that covered her face. Horo Shah guessed by Lady Rai's movements that she was not a young bride. She was at least in her late forties. Welcome, Uncle Tadao, and this must be your new wife, Lady Rai, as she spoke as he bowed. I had not heard that you married again. I have had my new bride for over a year now, his uncle told him. Congratulations, though, my good wishes are late. It is good to have a new member join our family, as she spoke with a smile. Lady Rai bowed her thanks to her nephew. Your trip must have been long, as she said. I have set up refreshments for you and all those who have traveled with you. It was long, Uncle Tadao spoke. But I enjoyed hearing the sounds of nature and the different towns we traveled through. He reached out his hand, and Lady Rai took it. And then he said, my poor wife. She did seem bored for several days but then on the last leg of our trip, the town magistrate joined us. He played several games of go with my wife as her lady's maid looked on. I rode his horse with the guidance of one of my guards. I don't get to ride much anymore. It was exhilarating. I heard that your eyesight is fading, as she spoke with a hint of concern. It has, but it has not stopped me from getting around, Uncle Tadao replied. I am becoming accustomed to using a cane to find my way and the occasional guiding hand of my lovely new bride. Lady Rai, are you originally from the Gama province or some other province? As she inquired. The woman didn't reply. Please excuse my wife, Uncle Tadao spoke. We found out yesterday that her mother died, and she is observing Chinmoku. Days of mourning. Her Chinmoku is more strict than the ones we observe. She is not permitted to speak for 10 days. Her lady's maid will act as a surrogate and speak for her if my wife wishes to engage in conversation. You have my condolences, as she told her. Lady Rai bowed her head, acknowledging his polite gesture. Uncle Tadao asked, What is this I hear about needing the town magistrate? We came across him and his deputy as they were heading down the mountain from the temple. I asked them to join us since we had the same destination. As she informed his uncle and the town magistrate what had happened on the Gaka estate, he told them about hiring Horo Shah, the Ranan detective, and about the deaths and attempted murder of the house physician. Some time later, the staring feline has not been recovered. Uncle Tadao inquired more shocked over this news than any of the other startling news. No, uncle, it has not, as she replied. You, Ronan, Uncle Tadao called out in the direction he believed Horo Shah was standing. She had moved several times as she explained the situation to the men. Horo Shah lifted her hand as if the uncle could see her and said, I am here. Uncle Tadao turned in her direction and said, You sound young. 
How old are you? I am 17. You are young for a detective. Uncle Tadao spoke, then turned his attention back to his nephew and said, Eshi, you should have hired the samurai detective. He would not be available for another two weeks, as she told his uncle as if it explained everything. Horo Shaw was available so I hired. He turned to her, debating whether or not to divulge the Ranan's small secret and decided against it. It would be interesting to let his uncle figure it out on his own. So as she said, dot 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 him. How long has he been here? Uncle Tadao inquired. As she turned to the Ranan and then informed his uncle, almost a full day now. Uncle Tadao grumbled something incoherently. And then he stated, show us to our residence. I will be staying until this situation with the staring feline is settled. Are you sure, uncle? There is a murderer on the loose. I have six of my own guards with me, Uncle Tadao spoke. I will be fine. An estate guard approached Eshi and said, we found this among the groom's belongings. It appears he was writing this letter to give to someone. Eshi took the letter and read it. Horosha moved up behind him so that she might read it also. The groom's letter. Samba, if you don't want me telling anyone about your mistress past, you will pay me five pieces of gold. I will take the money and leave but if I am not paid, I will go straight to the governor and tell him what sort of woman Gaka Nico really is. Meet me behind. The writing is smudged, Horosha stated. It is smudged as if the groom was interrupted and he never finished the letter. Maybe this is how someone was able to sneak up behind him and hit him over the head as Kipa had been hit over the head. May I see the letter? The town magistrate requested. As she hesitated, but then he handed him the letter. The town magistrate quickly read it over, and then he tucked the letter inside his uniform. The town magistrate told Eshi, While you tend to your guests, I and my deputy will begin our own investigation. We will not stop until we have captured the killer and the proper punishment has been dispensed. The town magistrate and the deputy headed off. Eshi told his uncle, I have the white daffodil residence set up for you and your wife, and those with you. Horosha was unusually quiet, for the most part, as she observed the new guests, and the town magistrate and his deputy. She headed off toward their own residence as she said, Come, Rico, we need to hurry. Time that had once been a nuisance has transformed into a monster. The boy quickly followed after her as she entered the private path beside the stable. And then he asked, Where are we going and why do we need to hurry? I can't explain my reasoning just yet, but I have a feeling something as tragic as another murder is about to happen. And I need to interview Nico again. I believe everything is starting to revolve around her. We will go this way to our residence and then make our way to the house physician's residence. Rico whispered, do you believe that she is the killer? I don't know, she replied. I hope to have a better sense of things after I have spoken with her. Life lessons from tea. Water has to boil before hot tea is made just as the embers of danger are stoked by Mayam. Chapter 52. Dealt by reputation. The Red Lotus Residence's Courtyard. The Ronin and the boy hurried past their residence toward their destination. Horosha noticed the housekeeper and called to her. Emery, did you ever find the note the mistress of the manor sent you requesting you meet her at the orchard? No, I returned to my office and it was not on my desk. The housekeeper replied as she turned and waited on the two of them. I looked all over the office but it was not there. Thank you, Horosha said as she rushed to see Nico again. The Red Clover residence. Nico was still by her friend's side when Horosha and Rico arrived. The town doctor, Gyro, had finished examining Samba. How is she? Horosha inquired. Gyro told her, Samba is thankfully breathing on her own. Sometimes those in Kansui are unable to breathe and usually die while in the deep sleep. She will have to be monitored through all hours of the day and night. For now, there is nothing more that I can do. I am returning to town. I have other patients to attend to. Horosha walked over to Gado as the town doctor left, and she questioned him, have you heard anything about the guard who was supposed to be watching the south gate? Gado answered, I just received a report that he has not been found. She nodded and then walked over to the mistress of the manor and said, Nico, I need to talk to you about something of a sensitive nature. I thought this might be the case, she spoke and smiled, turning in her seated position next to her friend. I am beginning to discover that you see things that most do not. You have been asking me about Kipa's past. I can tell you about him. No need, Horosha replied. And then she thought of Eshi and said, Sometimes people feel at ease around me and divulge things they might not with others. She looked to Rico and thought about telling him to leave, but he was her apprentice. She should not keep things from the boy that had to do with the case. She said, Gatto, could you please step outside? The new head guard went outside, knowing the Ronin wanted to talk to the mistress alone. Horosha waited a few moments and began. The clues I have been gathering have been pointing towards someone or something. I believe, Nico, they have been pointing at you. Do you believe that I am the killer? She questioned. Do you actually believe I am capable of committing these atrocious crimes? 
Rico wasn't sure what Hora was up to. He knew whatever she was doing it wasn't easy for her. She had come to care for the Gaka family. No? The Gaka household. Horosha didn't answer the mistress but stated without her manner giving anything away about how she felt. I must ask you a few things. Nika wanted to question her again if the young woman believed she was the culprit but instead, she stifled a sob and nodded. The short time Horosha, that Yoke had been there. Nico had grown to like this unusual young woman with an apt mind. Now this young woman was questioning her as if she was the killer. Now this young woman seemed to be seeing her with different eyes. I have discovered that you are a... Horosha spoke and then whispered, former prostitute. She stated in a normal voice, as she came across you and... Nico put a hand over her mouth, shocked to discover that Yoke had uncovered her closely guarded secret. She had thought Yoke wanted to know about Kipa's past, but the young woman must already know and know how they were linked. Nico feared how this young woman would see her now. Horosha paused in her interrogation as she noticed the unintended reaction to her statement. The matter they were speaking about was more sensitive than she realized. Sometimes she could be so blunt, a double-edged trait, a trait that could help and hurt. Horosha thought about taking back her statement, somehow rephrasing it, but she needed to stay on task, not give in to her emotions. She decided to move forward. Horosha began again, as she came across you and fell madly in love with you. He didn't care what you were in eventually proposed and then settled your debt with the brothel. He brought you back, not as a courtesan or a concubine but as his wife, as she made you a lady and mistress of the manor. He loved and cherished you. He might have back then, but he no longer cherishes anything but his art and the art his family once created. Nico spoke with contempt of things that were not flesh and blood. What you say was true and because of that, I believe it is a possibility that you became jealous of his art. Do you believe I killed Kipa and the groom and tried to kill my friend to somehow get back at my husband? Nico inquired, and then she set her friend's hand on the bed and stood to face the Ronin detective on more equal ground. Do not forget about the painting he cherished, staring feline, was stolen, Horosha added to the list of crimes and then gauged the older woman's reaction. Tears streamed down Nico's face as she spoke. Tell me why you believe I killed those people. I have another question for you before I answer any of yours. Horosha replied and went right into her interrogation. When Samba was drowned in the Koi Garden, I noticed as you entered the garden that your kimono was dirty around the knees. I see that you had a housemaid bring you new clothes and you changed out of that kimono. How did the other kimono get dirty? I... I fell. I fell after I tripped, Nico replied. It is as simple as that. Horosha studied her reaction to her inquiry, and then she said, For most, it would be a simple matter. But I believe in your case, it is not. Why did you fall? I said I tripped, Nico spoke angrily. It is as simple as that. I discern that this subject is very touchy for you, so I will come back to it at another time, Horosha said. Tell me about the groom. You are relentless in asking about him. Nico spoke as her usual restrained demeanor unraveled slightly. I have not seen him. I have not been to the stable. I don't know who he is. I did ask Samba why she was arguing with him, but she wouldn't tell me. Nico replied as she looked at the house physician helplessly lying on the bed. Tears streamed down her face as she said, I cannot believe that you think I would ever hurt Samba. She is my friend. Horosha paused as she decided she had taken this necessary ruse far enough, and then she smiled and stated with certainty, Nico, I said that it appears, not that I believe that you did all those things. I believe reputation is very important to you, but I believe friendship, respect, and love are much more important to you. Horosha decided she could comfort and ease some of the concerns of the older woman and spoke. Nico, your previous occupation does not bother me. I see you no different. You are still the Nico who scolded me for being disrespectful to your position in this household. You are still the Nico who refused to let me drink Emerald Dragon Empress tea. The mistress wiped the tears from her eyes and said, You mentioned two instances where I was horrible to you and not at all kind. No, I mentioned those two instances because you cared enough not to let me run around like some wild child. I was a stranger to you then. And I am a friend to you now. Why are you telling me all of this? Horosha stated. As I said before, the clues I have been gathering have been pointing toward you. I have considered all of the clues including the unsent letter from the groom. Nico, I believe someone is trying to frame you. The soul of tea. I stare at my new friend. A friend I just interrogated. I would like to have tea with her again but first, I must remove the assertion of murderer that someone has attached to her. Chapter 53 Framing the Prize Painting The Red Clover Residence Rico knew how hard it was for Horosha to keep questioning Nico as if she was the guilty party. He didn't completely understand why she seemed so harsh. Rico decided to be quiet about it and observe. He was Horo's apprentice, and he was there to learn, 
Nico, I believe someone is trying to frame you. Trying to frame me? The mistress exclaimed. Two thoughts wrestled within her, and Nico focused on one, the doubt she thought the young woman had concerning her. She started to say, so you do not believe that I... Yoke, I thought you saw me as a friend killer. I see you as a fourth victim, Horosha informed her. Nico's mind calmed down enough to focus on the second thought wrestling within her, and she asked, do you believe someone is trying to blame me for the murders? Yes, I believe someone is trying to frame you in more than one way. Please explain, Nico requested. Someone wants me to believe that you committed the murders, but they are also framing you as if you are a prized painting that must be displayed to the whole world. You said, someone wants me? Are you saying someone wants you to believe me or maybe more like the samurai detective? Horosha started to explain. If he had not been busy with another case, he would be here. She paused and then stated, a scheme has been set in motion, and one of the parts has to be the samurai detective or someone looking into the crimes. I just happen to be playing that part. Tell me more about this framing that seems to have two meanings. Certain clues are pointing at you, Horosha said. Your muddy knees are one example, and the white horse hair I found on your shoulder is another. She removed the black material from the handkerchief and showed her the white hair. And then Horo Shaw continued, Normally, I would consider you a suspect but those two out of the three clues seem forced. Or maybe contrived is a better word. She paused to allow those thoughts to sink in. And then Horo Shaw said, You do not want to tell me why you really fell but if you were the one trying to drown Sanba, it would be more likely that your kimono would be wet, not muddy as you held your friend's head underwater. I also found this horsehair on your shoulder as if you had been to the stable, but the horsehair was sticky with pine sap as if someone wanted the hair to stick to your clothing and be discovered. Nico looked at the white hair and the black material and then spoke, you said two out of the three clues. I believe someone went to great lengths to have you come across the shovel that was most likely used to bury Kipa. It was the shovel you found near the vault courtyard. You picked it up and placed it in the tool storage house just as the housekeeper came in. I don't understand, Nico said. You and the housekeeper both told me when I interviewed you about Keepa's death that the other had sent a message. You were both right, and you were both wrong. I don't think the housekeeper sent you a message to meet her in the orchard, and I don't believe you sent her a message to meet her in the orchard. Nico thought about it and then stated, someone else sent the messages. Horo Shah nodded. I get it now, Rico spoke excitedly. Horo, you are saying someone planned for Gaka Nico to come across the shovel and have it in her possession just as the housekeeper came across her. But that would mean, it would mean that we are dealing with someone who has engineered a complex plan. A mastermind. Horo Shah interrupted. What I don't like is that I have no clue how deep into the plan we are or what the ultimate goal is. She paused and then focused on what she had been saying before, and then Horo Shah told Nico. The shovel, your muddy knees, and the white horsehair link you to what happened to Kipa, Samba, and the groom. It would be enough for any magistrate to arrest you. She glanced at Rico, thinking about what she had said about time, and then Horo Shah informed Nico. If you haven't heard, I should tell you that the town magistrate is here along with Uncle Tadao and his wife, Lady Rai. Nico considered what the Ronin had said and asked, who would do such a thing and why? I don't know, Horo Shah replied as she glanced at the table and noticed one of the housemaids had brought in some tea, perhaps when she brought the mistress a change of clothes. A tray was on the table with a cloth over it to keep the heat in. Tum, Nico, I will make you some tea. You should rest. You have not left your friend's side since the incident. Horo Shah urged her, come drink some tea. Life lessons from tea. Tea. Easily shared as a conversation. Chapter 54. The scheme moves forward. The Red Clover residence. Tea was in order. So Horo Shah didn't wait on a reply and removed the cloth from the tray. She found a reddish pink cast iron pot decorated with a cherry tree in full bloom. Also on the tray were four matching cast iron cups. She removed the lid with the aid of the cloth and added tea leaves from a canister. Steam came out of the pot for the water was still very hot. Five minutes went by as the leaves brewed, and then the tea was ready. Nico, I misspoke before, Horo Shah stated as she poured for the older woman. As she didn't need to make you a lady. You were always a lady? She wasn't used to saying such things to people or interacting with people beyond solving mysteries for them so what she said. It made herself blush. Horo Shah was still very socially awkward but spoke from her heart. I mean to prove your innocence. I believe Ashi will also stand behind your innocence. He has finally remembered his family and how important all of you are to him. The Ronin poured the boy and then herself a cup of tea. Horo Shah knew why she loved tea so much. It was something easily shared and provided time to spend with others. She remembered the time she spent with the crying samurai and the priestess over a hot cup. She easily asked questions back then for she was a very curious child but, 
Horo Shah found socializing beyond tea was a very hard task. Tea brought an ease to conversations and over the years, she learned to talk to others as if she was always having tea. Nico sipped on her black tea and after some time had gone by. She said, I started to suspect my past might have something to do with the murders when the town doctor explained what the bamboo knife was used for. I heard you tell the boy that you believe the bamboo knife was used to lure Samba to the edge of the pond so that someone could drown her. Horosha nodded, and then she thought of a question and asked, what did Samba do before she came to live on the estate with you and became the house physician? She was a midwife, Nico replied as another secret was hinted at, and then she realized something that was spoken earlier, and stated, You said before that what I said about Eshi only caring about art was true as if it was in the past. I did because it is no longer true, Horosha spoke. I had a long talk with your husband. I believe he realizes that he can only have one important thing in his life that trumps everything else. I believe he realizes he must choose between his family and his obsession with the Anamaru style. He can't be devoted to both, one must take precedence. Are you saying that he has decided which should take precedence in his life? I am, Horosha replied. It will take time. He must change habits that he has developed over the years. They sipped on their tea some more and in the quiet of the residence, Horosha found clarity and a certainty of her mission she had lost when the first murder occurred. She had no doubts about what she needed to do. Horosha also knew that outside forces were working against her. I mean to prove your innocence, Nico, but I need time, and I am not sure how much I have. There seems to be something or someone at work behind. Horosha. Gato yelled as he ran in. She asked, what is it? Before the head guard had a chance to answer, the town magistrate barged in and declared, Gaka Nico, I am here to arrest you for the murders of Kipa, the head guard and Ekino, the groom and for the attempted murder of Sanba, the house physician. He put a hand to his sword and stated, and by the authority granted to me as town magistrate, I am also here to administer your punishment with a swift beheading. Tihaiku, traitorous file scheme, crime, punishment also swift, tea of truth come out. Chapter 55, judge, jury, and executioner. The Red Clover residence. Horosha moved and positioned herself between the town magistrate and Nico, and then Horosha asked, how could you have come to a conclusion and verdict so quickly? You have not been on the estate two hours yet. Unlike you, Ron and Detective, I can work quickly and put all the clues together. The town magistrate replied as he had not predicted the Ronan's interference. I had the steward round up the household and the guards, and I spoke to each of them. I inspected the bodies of the groom and Kipa, and I even heard about the clues you managed to gather. It was not hard to figure it all out after reading the blackmail letter the groom had started. The town magistrate paused as she entered the residence, and then the town magistrate continued. I believe Gaka Nico had Kipa steal the staring feline. I believe she wanted the head guard to destroy the painting but instead, he was going to sell it. In a fit of rage, she hit him over the head then tried to bury her mistake. The silver coins were what she would have paid him if he had destroyed the painting, so she still paid him even in the afterlife. He tapped the tip of his hilt, preparing at any moment to draw the sword as he explained. Nico thought she got away with the perfect murder, but one of her earrings fell into the hole. When the earring was discovered and the inept Ronan detective was still unable to put things together, Nico thought she had gotten away with the murder. Later, the groom shows up. The groom knew nothing about Nico being a psychopathic killer, but he did know a secret about her that he thought he could profit off of. It is a secret I still have to figure out. He along with Samba were going to blackmail Nico, but Nico eliminated them before they had a chance to bring to light her secret. I mean she has almost eliminated both of them. She is waiting for an opportunity to finish off the house physician. All of that is a lie, Nico declared. I killed no one, and I never hired Kipa to steal the painting. You have done everything that I have stated, the town magistrate told her, and then he directed his attention to the Ronin and ordered, move aside. I am here to administer her punishment, panic set in. What motivation could be behind this new ploy to swiftly take Nico's life? Horosha could barely think. The cat painting. No. Maybe. What could be the ploy? What would? Revenge. Someone was out for revenge, and Nico's life was the focal point of this retaliation. Time had become a monster, an ogre of reprisal and quick retribution. The terrifying beast that represented a sensation of failure and blindness had taken the form of a large hideous monster. It had escaped the labyrinth of her mind and was rampaging through her heart. Horosha had to think in haste, and she told Eshi, if you love your wife, quickly take your fastest horse, ride to town, and have the governor hold off her execution. Quickly go, Eshi, I will safeguard your wife until then. The master of the manor just stood there as if he believed in his wife's guilt. Horosha thought he would immediately rush off. 
but maybe she misgaged his love for his family. Or maybe it wasn't his wife's innocence that he didn't believe in. As she doubted her, her ability as the Ronin detective. Horo Shah had not been able to solve one thing and in Eshi's eyes, the Ronin was inept because the one he hired couldn't even find his stolen painting. She was forced to use the one thing she had safeguarded as leverage in case she needed to force Eshi to speak the truth to her. I know where your painting is, Horo Shah blurted, and the confusion on Eshi's face became an expression of outrage and disbelief. She continued, hoping to lure him into doing what was right, when you return with the governor and the governor has stayed your wife's execution, I will give you the painting. Eshi looked as if he doubted the Ronin, so she added, on my honor, I know where the painting is. The master of the manor looked as if he still doubted, not the Ronin's word but Horo Shah's ability to solve the mysteries. She would have to set her pride to the side if she was going to save Nico. So she pleaded, give Rico enough time to find the samurai detective. Lord Tante owes me a favor. He will immediately come. Please, give the boy enough time to find him so that the samurai detective can prove your wife's innocence. He still didn't say anything to her and just as she was going to get on her knees to beg, as she turned and hurried out. The town magistrate laughed and said, I know you would have no pride as a ronin, but I thought at least you would have pride as a detective. Rico started to say something as he put a hand to the tanto tucked in his sash, and she shook her head so he wouldn't draw the knife and come to her defense. Horo Shah knew what she had done but there was no other way. She would worry about her reputation later. She had to save Nico. Rico, go borrow a horse from the stable if you are able to ride and go to my sister's. Sakura should know where the samurai detective is. Find Lord Tante and bring him here. Hurry, she could tell the boy wanted to argue, but he turned and ran for the door. She noticed Rico wiped his eyes with his arm as if he had been crying. Horo Shah turned her attention to the town magistrate as she told Nico, I was wrong before. I am not playing the part of the detective. It would seem that the town magistrate has taken that position in the scheme. I am not sure what you are talking about. The town magistrate began, and then he questioned the Ronin, but I would like to know just how are you going to stop me? Horo Shah unsheathed her sword as she turned to the new head guard and shouted, Gato, bar the door and let no one else in. She placed both hands on her hilts and told the town magistrate, I will do what I have to. You will not be executing Nico while I am still alive. The soul of T. I am blind to the truth. The scheme is prevailing against me. I am afraid. Afraid my friend will die because my apt mind cannot see. The end. Next. How to frame a murder's conclusion. Part 2. Household of death mystery.